You're listening to the Overcast. Sunshine on a cloudy day. Part of the Oversoul Gaming Channel. Hello there, everyone, and welcome to the Overcast, your joke making, fun having, pop culture podcast. I am always, as always, am your host, Justin, aka Oversoul. And I am your co-host, Nick, a.k.a. The Vaping Fee. Indeedioso. That's who he is. That's who he is, last time I checked, anyway. Yes. And, as always, we're bringing you the shiniest of suns on the where, when? Cloudiest of days? Those. Indeed. Uh, and there's been a bit of a mix lately, because it's been... Yeah. It's either been... Really sunny and hot and hot as hell, or really rainy and hot as hell. <laughs> so <they're> yeah, rainy. <laughs> that. So, yeah. Uh, although there have been a couple of really nice breezy days lately, I, I didn't mind too much. <laughs> <clears throat> yeah, I will say. Um, uh, yesterday wasn't too bad, especially earlier in the morning. But anywho. It is July 6th, 2024, at the time of recording this, my fine, fine audience, and a uh, bit of a peek into the later. This episode is going to be all about soundtracks, favorite um, music in general from movies, video games, all kinds of stuff, the the me- memorables. Yes. This one was Nick's idea, by the yes, way. Yes, it was. To give credit for that. Um, yeah, <clears throat> yeah, and I'm I'm down with it because there's plenty of stuff to talk about, and both of us very recently have partaken of a lot of uh, uh, songs from Family Guy, so it's probably fresh in our mind. Yes. Uh, <laughs> so, anywho, but we'll be talking all about it. Uh, yeah, I have a lot of things to say about uh, like Square Enix sound music in particular, for sure. Mm-hmm. Um, but. Before all that, it'll be a usual dose of the life updates and the um, media corner and what have you. We were Saiyan's media corner the last two episodes because it was all about them Vigi games. Mm-hmm. So, but uh, we'll have a little bit of a mix for you to this time. Ah, uh, so I uh, I think I'll go first with the life updates this time, just because I don't have a whole lot to say. Uh, I mean, there has been a lot happening, and I'll go into more details in an update video on my YouTube channel about it, because I don't want to muddy the waters of this show with with it, but... Uh, I was going to say, how was your 4th of July? Oh, I worked. <laughs> I didn't, Fair. You know. um, but suffice it to say, on, on all of that, let's just say, um, sometimes you grow and change, and the people from your past don't, and uh, sometimes... That can cause conflict, and as difficult as it may be, that does mean that sometimes you have to go your separate ways. Yeah. Unfortunately, it yeah, it does. Yeah, and sometimes, you know, those people, uh, they, they, they do eventually, after they've had the time to reflect on themselves, they do change and grow, and, uh, Eventually, they come back and apologize for the harm they caused, and you rekindle a new relationship. Mm-hmm. Uh, present company, prime example. <laughs> yes. Uh, it, sometimes it just works that way. It does. Uh, you know, so, yeah, we'll see what happens, but right now, um, yeah. Let's just say that I had an old friend that didn't like that I learned how to start setting boundaries, and they became insufferable yeah. as a result. So, uh, outside of that, though, um, a lot more online time uh, with Sky. I've been spending, we, uh, we finished Little Hope and A Way Out. We played through both of those. Um, we got the Platinum in A Way Out. Uh, nice. Even though 
one one the requirements for one particular trophy damn near broke my thumb off <laughs> uh, but but we did it we did it actually it was easier than I, I i found out it's one of those quick time events where you have to mash the button the goal there is to do so many like pull-ups basically mm-hmm. um well they're not pull-ups they're more like push-ups but it's the one where you put your hands there's a like a, a u-shaped bar there and you put a hand on either side and you have to like push yourself up with your arms and down but not let your feet touch the ground that exercise mm-hmm. um so kind of like a pull-up push-up mix uh, i think they're called dips is what they're called okay um but anyways, so you have to do 20 dips, and it's a button mashing thing, but the more you do, the harder it gets, and the the harder and faster you have to mash the button, and there's a lot of resistance, and you have to do 20 of them, and I eventually learned that if I just put the controller down flat on the table and use my index finger to mash the button, that that's a lot easier, and I would switch between my index and middle finger, because once you got the meter up high enough, there was enough leeway to switch fingers real quick without ruining it, mm-hmm. so... It ended up being not as hard as I thought it was going to be, but it's definitely the last thing we went to do. <laughs> um, so, but yeah, we both got the nice shiny platinum out of that. Uh, we both have our platinums in Man of Medan as well. Nice. Um, so we've both seen every outcome that that game has to offer. And we played through Little Hope together. We decided to only do one playthrough together of that one and then just do the rest on our own. So we're both working on that. But we did start our co-op playthrough of House of Ashes. Nice. Now, let me tell you something, dude. This is why I think any of these games that you play, the like, you know how you've, you've finished all of these, right? Yes. Yes, I have. I really think at some point you need to go back and play them again on Curator's Cut mode. And okay. here's why. Because everything you didn't see the first time around is what you see in Curator's Cut mode in these games. The perspectives when characters split up in Curator's Cut mode, you play as the other characters. So, you may remember how House of Ashes takes place during the war in Iraq in 2003. And, um, you know how one of the playable characters, Salim, is on the other side, right? Yeah. You you remember that? Yeah. Okay. So, you know the part where they're going to, um, where they actually head out on the helicopters and they're going to look for stuff and then all that fighting starts and they are, uh, and they fall down into the caves and all that after that fighting? Uh Uh-huh. Um, you remember how that fighting kicks off because one of their helicopters was destroyed by a rocket launcher? Yeah. Okay, well... We're playing co-op on this me and her. She's getting the player one perspective, like the solo story perspective, the one you got where she's down on the ground with all of the American soldiers fighting yeah. for her life in that section. During that part, I was playing as Salim up on the hill. And this is also what you would be doing in curator's cut mode of this game at this point. Playing as Salim, I'm the one who shot that rocket at the helicopter that started everything. Oh, Jesus. Okay. So you that's how you find that out. It's either... Be, you can also refuse to do it, and if you do, your cap, his captain will take the rocket from him, and he'll be the one to shoot instead. But... So this added some perspective, because you know when Salim and Jason run into each other at the end there, before they all fall into the hole, Salim has a chance to shoot Jason in the back, and instead he's like, no, no more killing. Well... <laughs> In curator's cut mode, or if you're player two in shared story, you can actually choose to shoot and kill Jason there as Salim. <laughs> so, oh, okay, yeah. So this is why I say, if you ever want to see the full story of these games, you definitely gotta go back and play them again on curator's cut mode, so you get to see all the shit you didn't see the first time around. Yeah, it's like it. You're literally getting the other side of the story, mm-hmm. playing it that way. You know. It's really cool, and all the decisions that you made the first time around, the computer will be making this time, and you'll be making different decisions, and it can really change how things play out. Yeah. So, I highly recommend that, because the Curator's Cut DLC is free for all four games. Hell yeah. So, definitely give those a replay on Curator's Cut sometime next time. As long as you finish the solo story and let the credits run all the way through and have a completed game file, Curator's Cut mode will be unlocked when you go to select a new game. It'll give you the option between Theatrical Cut and Curator's Cut. Right okay. there. Theatrical Cut is the one you played the first time around. Curator's Cut is the alternate uh, 
version yes. of events. So I highly recommend that because seeing the shit that I've seen so far playing House of Ashes, seeing the stuff I've seen on my side of things, I'm like, oh god, this is like a playing a whole brand new game, honestly. <laughs> it's so different perspective. So we've been doing that. Nice. And we've been having a lot a lot of fun and growing much closer and everything and so uh <clears throat> but you know, that's been Things have been going really, really well. It's very uh, refreshing to be able to communicate with someone on a level where I, I feel truly and fully understood. And mm-hmm. I've always said that I've always wanted my disagreements with people to uh, to sound, you know, like they do on a lot of the podcasts I listen to, very professional, yeah. and, you know, and like well-spoken and, you know, they don't get like emotional and insult each other and stuff, you know, like... Her and I had a pretty deep discussion about some of the stuff of uh, Little Hope because uh, she took some issues with the depictions of uh, the Salem witch trials. Not, not that it was it, the problem wasn't that it was done wrong or inaccurate. The problem was that it was too accurate. Fair. Uh, God damn. Um, it, and for some of the stuff that she believes in, that's considered a little disrespectful. Um, that's so, there, and uh, so you know, uh, we had a discussion about that because you know me, you know me, how I see art. It, it's not really, um, you know, I'm not really uh, I'm gonna agree or disagree on that. I just appreciate the historical accuracy and uh, how and how that whole game is basically a metaphor for PTSD, but um. But, like, I understood and respected her perspective on it because, you know, it wasn't a harmful perspective in any way, shape, or form. And it was uh, very well-spoken, and if anything, I found it educational and enlightening. Um, And it was just, it's got to be one of the most civil disagreements slash discussions I've ever had with anyone in my entire life. Like... I was almost dumbfounded and baffled by it because I I fully expect these things, you know, because of what I'm used to with most other people to get really emotional and argumentative. Mm -hmm. And it didn't. And I couldn't have possibly been more like, you know, that's one of those things that's like, yeah, that's that that's a deal sealer for me, (laughs) you know, you know. Uh, as as much as some people have deal breakers, and I do too, I also have deal sealers, and that's one of them. Yeah, that is that is a green flag if I've ever right. seen one. So, yeah, it, so honestly, it's been nothing but green flags, you know, and and like a, a like just like a huge genuine understanding of each other's feelings and what we're going through, and I think it helps that. To a degree, we are basically the same person. <laughs> um, yeah, you know, I've I've found someone that I can interact with and grow close to who is almost exactly like me in a lot of ways. Um, obviously, there's differences, but it, in a lot of the ways that matter, we're pretty much constantly on the same page. That's and awesome. Yeah, it's it's refreshing, honestly. Uh, I've. It's helping me unlearn a lot of trauma responses that I developed over the years because of past relationships. Um, certain phrases and things, especially in texts that I used to overthink and freak out over, I'm now learning to be, you know, because this is someone I can trust. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm. So I don't. I don't feel. Uh, I don't have as much anxiety about it. We are safe spaces for each other. For right. sure. Right. Um, which is how it should be. Absolutely. Uh, um, so yeah, that's been, you know, thanks to her and all that lately, my life has basically been going, regardless of anything else going on, things have been going really good. Like, I'll tell you, the other night when all that stuff that I mentioned before with, uh, my other friend came to a head and, uh. I I got into some arguments with some people about it, and it was a really busy night at work. I was on the verge of a breakdown, and she waited for me to get home. Normally, she's in bed by, like, at least 1030, if not sooner. Like, she's long asleep by the, the right now. And 
that night she waited for me to get home from work and get settled down and everything and stayed up until four in the morning talking to me God just damn. to make sure I was just to make sure I was okay. Um, she sounds like a keeper, bro. Yeah, and uh, you know it's it's gone both ways on all of that. Like anytime one of us needs the other, we're there, and uh, you know unless I'm like working or something. But she's understanding of that, obviously. That's awesome. Uh, I'm happy. She for has you. no. Re- she has no ridiculous or unreasonable expectations. Like she's very straightforward, uh, and uh, she can hold her own too. That's that's another thing. She knows how to stand up to people and set line, draw lines in the sand. Good. So yeah, uh, so yeah, it's been it's been like that. Oh, and we've been sending each other gifts here and there and stuff too. Nice. Uh, Apparently, I have a surprise package coming in the mail, and I don't quite know what's in it yet. I know there, there's cookies, but I but apparently there's also something off my Amazon wish list. Oh, uh, okay. So I can't buy myself any fun stuff until I know what it is, for fear I might buy the same thing. Fair <laughs> so, enough. Yeah. Um, and yeah, because I had sent her a uh, Snorlax Squishmallow a while back nice. as a gift. <clears throat> and some other stuff over time too, snacks and whatnot. So, but yeah, so that's where all that is. And basically, I've I've been really, really happy lately because of that. That's um, awesome. Shit, I have been, and it's we've rekindled each other's passion for trophy hunting on the PlayStation Two. So I've been doing a lot of that, and basically, I've been neglecting new releases that I would normally have played by now. Mm-hmm. Um. I mean, I played a little bit of Stellar Blade, and then I just went straight back to playing old shit again. <laughs> Fair so, enough. Yep, yep. But uh, after we finish finish House of Ashes, we're going to do It Takes Two, and then we're going to finish it off with The Devil in Me. There you we'll go. Have to figure out, we'll have to figure out something else. Yeah, that's the one she's most excited for because of the H.H. H. Holmes stuff. Yeah. Um, yeah, which, by the that one is by far my favorite, too, because of the... The similarities with Saw. Yes. <clears throat> House of Ashes is my second favorite, though. I love the, the changes they made to the series with that one. Yeah. Um. So So that's how all that's going, and then work has just been busy. The 4th of July was actually dead, like deader than a doornail. I was at work, but like it was slow. We were open till 11 that night. We didn't get any customers for, like, the last two hours of being open. Was there any uh, fireworks shooting off around anywhere near the restaurant that you guys could just stand out in the parking lot if you, if you weren't getting any orders? There were, but it was, like, just, you know, the the town hooligans and rednecks setting them off. It wasn't official. Fair. Fair enough. Uh, you know. Um, so, <laughs> <laughs> the town hooligans... <laughs> <laughs> Boy, that's uh, that's the old in me coming out. Uh, that <laughs> get off my lawn. Oh, uh, mm-hmm. yeah. Uh, in the latest episode of Fortress of Nerditude, when they uh, they address that whole fireworks thing, I'm definitely one of those people posting on social media about how much the fireworks at three in the morning are annoying the fuck out of me. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> You know, like, people are trying to sleep, you little dickheads. Right. <laughs> Setting them off in the parking lot right next to my apartment building. <laughs> right. So, yeah. The cats didn't seem too phased, though, surprisingly. Well, that's good. And thankfully, but yeah. <laughs> Oof. Um, but yeah, no, for some reason, Freeport decided against doing their usual fireworks show on the 4th. I guess they're doing it next week. I don't know why. Weird. Um, yeah, but either way, we weren't busy because I'm guessing everyone was cooking out and throwing 4th of July parties, so we had, you know, nothing. Right, yeah, that's fair. Uh, I'm glad I was closing that night so I had our security because everyone else got sent home earlier. There's like one guy that comes in to help from like five to eight and they basically told him to just do the floors and leave. <laughs> <laughs> like, you know, because at places like this, when you aren't making enough money, you know, labor hours, they got to send people home to compensate. Yeah. 
So that's how it works. Unless you're a closer. <laughs> you know what they say, hours are for closers. <laughs> uh, yes. Uh, no, it's a, a twist on the old phrase. Uh, of uh, When they say blank is for closers, that's more of a... That's more of a um, a business job thing, like, where they're, like, they have meetings where they're trying to sell people on stuff. And, like, it, being successful in in that business meeting is called closing the deal. And yes. so so that's when they say stuff like promotions are for closers. It's, you know, or, like, cookies are for closers. <laughs> you know, shit like that. It's for, you know, people who, uh, they mean it's for the, the people who succeed. Um, but... I'm turning it on its head and saying hours are for closers, as in people who work the closing shift. <laughs> yes. Uh, because it sure as hell is in an industry like this. Mm -hmm. Is generally how it goes. Although, granted, I didn't, I've didn't. i been working mornings the past couple days, and I didn't get sent home at all. But I will tell you, I kind of wish I did, because whew, the other day uh, I, was, I was working a 10 to 5. Mm -hmm. And they asked me. They asked me if I could stay till eight because someone else called in, and I was like, "Jeez." Oh, I was like, "Hmm." And the, let me tell you, this was working a ten to five after doing a closing shift the previous night. Like it. Not, God damn. Granted, granted, it was slow, but I didn't get off till eleven, and then you know go home and all that. But. uh and then turn around, yeah, like, there wasn't much turnaround time, especially for someone who, like, takes an hour to get up, an hour to get ready, and then an hour to walk to work. <laughs> so, right. You know, so, uh, I was super tired, but I did it anyway, but I told them seven. I will stay till seven, not eight, because I've got shit going on. Yeah. Uh, so, I did that. And, uh, and then today, it was only 10 to 4, but man, today I was feeling it. It caught up to me. I was s moving slow and barely awake. <laughs> uh, I believe it. But, uh, thankfully tomorrow, I don't have to be until, like, 4 p.m., so, uh, I get a full 24 hours between shifts this time, which is kind of like having a day off, so, that's nice. Yeah. That's nice. I feel nice about that. It means I can also afford to stay up late tonight and not have to worry about it. Mm -hmm. So, so yeah, that's basically all that's going on with me. Work, unnecessary drama, and uh, a lot of just talking to Sky pretty much every day. And, well, not pretty much, literally every day. There's not a single day that goes by that we don't say good morning and good night. There you go. At least. Um... And also, uh, and then, you know, playing games online on the days where I'm working, well, days, either on my days off or when I'm not working nights, mm -hmm. like Monday, I think Monday I'm doing a short little 11 to 2 hour, or 11 to 2 shift, so that day I'll have a lot of free time at night to hop on and play something. So that's actually our next planned play session as of right now. So... It has been, it has been mostly good, <laughs> mostly good lately. Good, good, good. And uh, I won't say I couldn't be happier because obviously there's always room for improvement, but I'm pretty goddamn content with the way things are at the moment. Good. I will admit. So, uh, and I'm excited to see where things end up going in the future too. But yeah, that's basically it for me. I hear that you've had uh, you've had quite the time since our last recording. Yes. So why don't you lay it on us? So a few weeks back, we were supposed my my daughter and I were supposed to go out to Des Moines, uh, for an overnight visit. However, that trip. Didn't go as planned. However, this week being 4th of July week, I had Wednesday and Thursday off, and I already have Fridays off. So Sarah and her mom drove out, left, 
they they left Iowa at um at like what five o'clock in the morning. They were at they got to my place by nine thirty, and we were on the road by no later than I think maybe maybe nine forty five. And then we we ended okay. up uh, stopping at the world's. It's literally called the once uh, like the like, it was like a halfway point. Literally called the world's largest truck stop. They've got a whole ass food court. They've got Taco Bell, Wendy's, Pizza Hut. Dairy Queen. Uh, inside a fucking truck stop. Like, dude, okay. this... It, 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 I've got pictures that were... That, that, that Sarah took of my daughter and I uh, standing outside the, uh, the, the... The world's largest truck stop. It was really fucking huge. But... We got back on we, we, we ended up getting we ended up getting to uh, Altoona um uh the, the, the town where her mom stays uh and we we saw the we saw the doggy her the doggies for a little bit and then we went back to I think we went back to the apartment and chilled for just a little bit. Then we went back to her mom's and we went to a cookout at her aunt's house. Got to meet some more of her family. Met her brother. Um, Her stepdad's a wrestling fan. That's pretty cool. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, something to talk about. Something to talk about. Yes, absolutely. Um, man. and we did. We we did. Uh, after after the cookout, we uh we went and got went to the spot that uh Sarah's mom had uh picked out for the fireworks the night before so Tuesday night I think they went out and uh they picked their spot they put like I, this is the kind this kind of shit I've never seen this kind of shit done in Rockford those tarps would have been gone <laughs> in Rockford okay like people were putting out tarps reserving their spots for the fireworks a day in advance and when i say these fireworks were insane i'm telling you this is the best firework show i have ever seen and it was put on by the casino which is not that far from uh sarah's mom's house is this more of a a small rural town you would say altoona is j literally just outside des moines the d outside the capital of iowa okay so I guess, yes, technically then. I mean, because Des Moines wouldn't be, that would be a city, I guess, right? But l l let me give you an example as to how good these fireworks were. Well, I, the, the reason I asked, the reason I asked is because you mentioned the tarps and no one taking them. And I was going to say, if this, you know, if this is a small town, I was going to say. Oh, yeah. No, it, it's definitely, I would, I would. I'm not sure what the population of Altoona is, but the area, more specifically, is a safe area. 
Right, I was thinking small rural area, not like a big city or whatever. Um, yeah, I mean one okay. of the biggest, one of the biggest attraction, one of the biggest, like I mean, we, I mean in Altoona you've got a theme park uh, called Adventureland. You've got uh, the Prairie Meadows Casino. Um, okay, which has a whole ass hotel attached to it. All right. Well, the only reason I asked is because it was basically a setup for a joke. I was going to say that oh. the, uh, that 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 level of um, trust that people have is due to that small town hospitality. Yes. It's just too bad that those small towns also tend to be where the most heinous and gruesome murders take place, apparently. <laughs> so One of our favorite podcasts. <laughs> yeah. Sounds like one of our favorite podcasts. Yeah, that's that that's that's the reference. There you go. All right. I see what you were doing. All right, so <laughs> tell me Tell me um, about the tell me about the boom booms. Dude. Yeah. Better than any Disney fireworks I've seen. Really? Yes. Like they get they gave Disney a run for their fucking money. With this fireworks show, like that, fin- that grand finale was fucking insane. Hmm. Yeah. Intriguing. Yeah, and then we we uh we ended up we 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 went and ended up going back to Sarah's apartment in Des Moines. Um. And calling it a night, and then. Uh, actually, it was, um, during dinner at, uh, Sarah's aunt's house, her mom had, uh, invited us to go see a movie in the theaters with them the next day on the 4th, mm-hmm. and I'm like, my daughter's, I've never taken my daughter to a movie theater before, so... The movie that was selected was a kid-friendly movie. It just came out. And I'm like, you know what? Let's test it. Let's see how she does. If she talks too much, we'll leave. No biggie. Did you discuss movie theater etiquette with her ahead of time? Yes, I absolutely did. Good, good. Because apparently there are some grown ass adults that still don't understand that. I am so proud of my daughter. I only had to correct her a couple of times. Otherwise, yep. she was as quiet as a mouse and absolutely loved this movie. Yeah. Now this yeah. movie that I'm referring to will be getting a media corner entry, which is why I haven't said the title of it. But I am just so proud of my daughter for with everything that she has going on in that little brain of hers right now. I I um I am so so proud. That that's a proud dad moment right there. Nice. I'm so glad that she did so well with her first time in a the movie theater. And and the it was a it was a Cinemark theater, and these this movie theater the 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 the, the theater that we were in specifically, the chairs reclined. They had oh, lazy and, boys in the movie theater, bro. And you didn't fall asleep? No, I didn't. Yeah, because that's what you were worried about when you when we went to see If, and I was like, well, these showtimes have the reclining seats. <laughs> and you were like, but I might fall asleep. Yeah, that. No, I was, I was legitimately worried that I would fall asleep. I didn't. Good to know. Good to know that it works out fine. Yeah, I've seen a few movies in the recliners. I saw the second Spider-Verse movie in the recliner seats, and man, that was an experience just getting to lean back and really, like, just look up at the screen, and in the winter, you can turn on the heat, and the seats are heated, if you want. 
And there, I, the one other thing I forgot to mention, um, my daughter's first movie in a movie theater was in real D three D. So oh, she you... got she got to so her first movie theater experiences experience was a 3D was a movie in 3D. So that was pretty fucking cool. And she really enjoyed it. like she wasn't she, freaked out by it. No, she loved it. Nice. She absolutely loved it. That's awesome. And for those of the uh those not in the know, movie theater etiquette basically means Shut the fuck up and stay off your goddamn phone. Exactly. <laughs> you, know? <laughs> you know, be respectful to the people around you. They paid good and ass loads of money for this experience. You're ruining it with your obnoxious selfishness. That. You know, and I, I don't care if you aren't talking. Uh, yeah, your phone, if you're on it. Yeah, I can see the light and it's distracting me from the movie. Put the fucker away, you asshole. <laughs> that. <laughs> God, I hate that shit so much. Yeah. <laughs> oh, it gets on my nerves. I put, I put, I straight up turn mine all the way off. I don't even put it on silent. It just goes off. See, I, I even, I even forgot my, I had put my watch on, on the charger before I left the apartment to, to make sure it was charged up for enough to go to the movies. Nope. I forgot my watch too. So, I, yeah. <laughs> Well, there you go. <laughs> hey. Not a not a problemo. No, not uh, at all. But no, I uh Sarah had some surprises for for me and my daughter when we got to the apartment. I have a stitch sticker on my water bottle for work and three has been hotel stickers. Mm. I've got a a, a sticker that's got nifty and serpentious. Lucifer and uh, Lilith and Charlie and Vaggy. Oh, nice. Yeah. Very, very nice. Quick yes. uh, special special shout out and shameless self-promotion for the Has Been Hotel episode we did a while back, which to this day remains the most viewed podcast episode on both youtube and other platforms that we've done very nice okay yeah so far that episode is the only one that has almost reached triple digits in terms of viewership damn okay <laughs> yeah <laughs> uh, shouldn't be surprised by that though should not be surprised no no definitely not but I mean, okay, so there was uh so Friday Friday what we did is we got up we got up and we uh we got out the door and we went to the Blank Park Zoo. Didn't have to pay a dime out of pocket to to get in. Why? Because my daughter has a membership. And with that membership, <laughs> she can bring two guests free at any of, of any age, free of charge. So there was our there was Sarah my entry and Sarah's entry. Hold on, did you just, just did you just say blank park zoo? Are you censoring the name of the zoo? No, that's the name of the zoo. Whoa, <laughs> okay. I did okay. I, I I really confused. Blank Park Zoo. Okay. Yeah. Blank Park Zoo. It's it's a it's a tiny zoo. It, it's it's really cool. So there's there's an Aus, there's an Australia uh exhibit, and in the Australia exhibit, they have they have it gated off. Why do they have it gated off? Because there's wallabies. And other animals walking around freely. Oh yeah, nothing, nothing dangerous. Just 
They're walking around freely. <laughs> nothing dangerous. It, it, the animal's from Australia, and there's nothing dangerous, which means there's like three animals in the exhibit then, because everything from Australia is extremely dangerous. <laughs> I'm aware. <laughs> yes. But the, the, yeah, they had wallabies. Uh, they had, uh, yeah, they had the wallabies that were the. And then they had the, the, the parakeet enclosure in there, too. Ah, yes, yes, yes. That was yes, pretty yes. cool. Yes. Um, let's see. They had, um... I bet you I know I can name the one location you probably avoid in every zoo, the reptile house. There was no, oddly enough, there was no reptile house at the zoo. Which, of course, the reptile houses are going to have way more than just snakes in them, too, but... Yes. They've got, like, lizards and shit. Yes. Oh, yeah, they didn't have a... They didn't have a reptile... They don't have a reptile house. Okay. They, and the only aquatic animal that they have is the sea lions. Oh. That's still cool, though. I know, right? But no, um... They Boy, had a did kids you, area. Did you they see the kangaroos, where... mate? <laughs> yes! They had kangaroos. Yeah, the wallabies, the kangaroos... See, yes. no, kangaroos are dangerous. They've been known to drown people's dogs and kick your ribs in. <laughs> that. <laughs> so. They can get mean. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. But no, the, the wallabies were like little miniature kangaroos, and they were cute. Yeah, Rocco from Rocco's Modern Life is a wallaby. Yeah. But, um, no, they had this kid's area where you could feed the goats and whatnot. And, um, they had a, a llama in there. And the llama's name, get this, was Dolly. Dolly uh, Llama. I was hoping, <laughs> that is funny, but I was really hoping you were going to say Kuzco. I, you know what? I, <laughs> I looked at the, I looked at the llama and I said, oh, Hello there, Cusco. And then I looked at the then I looked at the sign. I'm like, oh, your name's Dolly. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> but no, they had they had peacocks roaming around, just walking around with people. And we, one thing that uh, out of all of the times that Sarah's been to this this zoo, she's never seen the peacocks do this. But the one of the peacocks, uh. Uh, decided to show off their feathers. Nope, they did the display. Yes, they did, and it was fucking beautiful, and I got a picture of it. Nice. It was amazing. It was so pretty. Very nice. Yes. Was it just goats and llamas in the uh, in the they, petting, there, petting zoo? There, there were pigs. There was a donkey. Hmm. But okay. though the the but the goats the goats are the only ones that you could really get to and like pet and get up close and personal with. Ah, uh, so one might even say that the petting zoo was goaded. <laughs> ah, I see what you did there. <laughs> oh man, <laughs> yeah, yeah. He's like, yeah, yeah. It was mostly just goats. I mean, they had some ass and swine, but you know, <laughs> just goats. <laughs> but no, dude. So, you know, the only exposure I've ever had until this past Friday, the only exposure I've had when it comes to a casino. Mm -hmm. is Grand Theft Auto Online, the casino on, on, on GTA Online. You know, the exposure I've had is movies, TV shows, stuff like well, that. Well, I mean, like, <laughs> I meant, like, getting it and oh. actually playing, like, the slot machines. Wait, you've never played a video game with slots in it before? You've played Pokemon. Pokemon has a whole gambling town in it. All of them do. Like, every Pokemon game has one town where you can play the slots. It's like known for gambling. I guess I never really paid attention to that part. 
Oh yeah, there's so many video games with slot machines in them as a mini game. In fact, Final Fantasy VII Rebirth, when you finally play that one, will have them <laughs> in. Well, I meant like, I meant like ca- casino first, level. I meant like first, like actually being inside of a casino. Oh, oh, the, the ca- simulated the, casino the, the, experience. The, the, yeah, yeah. The, the casino experience. Until this past Friday, I have never stepped foot inside of a casino. Well, the gold saucer in Final Fantasy VII Rebirth will feel like a wild anime casino. (laughs) I got to play on the slot machines in the Mm -hmm. smoker section at the (laughs) Prairie Meadows Casino while uh, Sarah's mom took my daughter to the big playground over by her house. We also a- got to see this was really cool and I've I, and I've never this is something something else I've never experienced before and I absolutely loved it. It was really cool. I got to watch the horse races at the casino. Ah, uh, OTB. Yes. I got pictures. I got betting. I got pictures too. It was pretty cool. Nice. Yeah. Nice. nice. Yeah. Yeah. And they're off to the races, and there goes, uh, what is that? There goes Crazy Housewife, followed by, wait, who is that? Followed by some random lady, followed by red-headed, <laughs> uh, red-headed crazy woman, followed by, uh, followed by someone who shouldn't be here. And now it seems a random lady is on the field. <laughs> <laughs> Man. Yep. No, dude, it was, it was uh, really cool. Here's a fun fact for you, by the way, hmm. about the about the slots in casinos. The ones by the doors, like when you first come in, almost always pay out the most in order to entice you uh, into more, especially at the hotels in Vegas. See, that I did not know. Sarah and I went a little <sighs> bit deeper in, and I ended up doing one of the, I think it was one of the one-shot uh, mm-hmm. slot machines. And I, I was, I was, I started off with twenty seven dollars, and I almost, I was almost up to forty dollars, but I started tanking and tanking and tanking. I'm like, ah, until and, until I had nothing but ten cents left. I'm like, ah, all right, I'm done. Yep, <laughs> that's that's how it that's that's how it works. I thought that is unfortunately how it works. Yeah, but also. The more you bet, the higher your odds, but also the um, See, the higher the risk. Yep, that's usually how gambling works. Yeah, no, it was fun. It was it. It's not gonna be like an every week thing because that's definitely that definitely no. won't be a thing. Hell no, I am not going to develop an. Uh, uh, I'm not going to develop another habit. Um, <laughs> I will say it. I would like to go every once in a while, just for fun, you know. Just go for go with a set budget, and once that budget's gone, call it a day. That's the way to do it. Hell because yeah. some people they they tend to win big, and then they get cocky, and they're like, "Well, I'm on a roll. Might as well keep going." And then they lose that. It. So I've seen people like win like a thousand dollars and be like. And then go like double or nothing, and then lose everything. Mm-hmm. So yep, like like you should have just walked away with the thousand. Exactly. Like, what the fuck is wrong with exactly. you? Exactly. But it's yeah, they get in, they get into this habit. I won't I won't gamble at all because I think it's a waste of money. But I I do I I appreciate the science and psychology behind mm-hmm. it from like the pers- the perspective of someone who looks at things that way. And I do know like. I mean, nine times out of ten, the house is always going to win, but there are ways to game the system if you're smart mm-hmm. enough. You know, people like counting cards and for blackjack and shit like that is a real thing that people smart, very smart people, way smarter than me, know mm-hmm. how to do. Uh, so, but also they get banned from casino- casinos for doing Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> So, which is stupid because all they're doing is playing them is like beating them at their own game, but the casinos are too arrogant to handle that loss. Yeah. So, you know, because they're intentionally designed 
to siphon as much money out of people as possible. Very rarely do people walk away with like loads of money. It's almost always they lose more than they gain. Yeah. But no, I. That's just how it's designed. But no, it's, we. I got to. I got to meet. Uh, I got to meet Sarah's family. I got to meet. Uh, Sarah's mom's dogs. She's got two little. I'm not sure what breed they are, but she's got one named Smokey Joe. And the other is Bandit. <laughs> Bandit and Smokey Joe. Like Smokey and the Bandit. Oh my god. I, I In my head, I literally just heard diddling ding 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 ding. <laughs> and then I got to meet Sarah's little ball of fluff. Flanagan Ooh, Flanagan kitty. Ryder Jackson. Holy sh- Oh, from Tangled. Yes. <clears throat> Flynn Ryder. Yes, that's that's his full name. Fl- Flanagan Ryder Jackson. <laughs> Very nice. Yes. It's cute. <laughs> it, but my friends call me Flynn. Yes. I call him Flynn Kitty. <laughs> yeah. There you go. There you go. That's Flynn good, Kitty. Yeah. Fl- and you say it fast, it sounds like flinkity. Yes. Flinkity. <laughs> flinkity, flinkity, flu. Flinkity, flinkity, fla. <laughs> yes. Yeah. No, it was it was a fun <coughs> time. Excuse me. And then, and then uh, uh, her, Sarah's dad's um, girlfriend um, was basically giving up her uh, crocheting yarn and she had like 24 25 totes full of crocheting yarn that she was just giving away so my mom being the crocheter that she is uh, like first person that uh sarah could think of was my mom so my mom now has more than enough yarn for crocheting projects. Very nice. Yes. So I got to meet her dad and uh, uh, her dad's uh, girlfriend uh, before we uh, before we hit the road back to Rockford. Another four and a half hour trip. It was fun. And well worth it. Nice. Yeah. Well, sounds like it was a fun and uh, fantastic time. Oh, if, but, and things uh, even get even get even even get even better. They, I have not been able to find this drink in Rockford for months. The second I step foot into a grocery store in Iowa. I see Pepsi Mango on the shelf. Really? Yes. I picked up a 12 pack. I bet your sweet ass I did. <laughs> I brought that shit back with me. <laughs> nice. I showed I like I, 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 I this is one of the first things I showed my mom when I came back because I know she loves Pepsi Mango. Her jaw dropped damn near to the ground. (laughs) I'm like, Mom, look what I I, got. I I like the new peach flavored um, Pepsi. I haven't. Uh, That one's. I haven't tried the uh, the 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 peach the peach flavored the uh, the peach Pepsi yet. I know. I I have. I like. I like the mango flavor because. And I've getting I've been getting the mango flavor since what, 2022. Huh. It's yeah. fucking delicious. Well, let's see. We just had a major holiday and it's been 2 weeks since the last time we recorded, so I'm not surprised that there was a lot to talk about, but yeah, uh a bit of a longer life update for us. We both had exactly basically a half hour worth of shit to talk about. Yeah, a little about. bit. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but uh okay i but um 
yeah, I guess for the sake of time, I say now is probably a good uh, good time to transition over to the media corner because uh, we we have a shorter one this uh, this week, folks. Yes. So it's only going to be three items. Yes. So. Oh, I'm sorry. I can get ahead of myself. I- I'm anxiety. I- I'm one of Riley's new emotions, and we are just super jazzed to be here. Where can I put my stuff? All right, everyone. Welcome to the Media Corner, the part of the show reserved for news, reviews, and recommendations, and sometimes previews. And, uh, it sounds like in this episode, we're gonna have three reviews for you. And I have two. He has one. So I'll go first, because that's how patterns work. Yes. (laughs) Uh, yeah. So... I am circling back to something I promised I would do in a previous episode, and now I'm going to give a full review for Inside Out 2. Um, All right. So uh, I'll be hitting on some of the things I mentioned before in the, like, when I just spoke on it briefly before. But, um, yeah, so in this sequel, uh, the idea here is that Riley is now a teenager, and she is going off to a summer camp for hockey, uh, like a training camp, with some of her high school friends. Um, but along the way, they get to talking, and she kind of discovers that they are going to a different school than her in their next semester. and um, Or they're going to a different high school. I think they're going from middle school to high school, and they're going to different schools. And she's really sad about that, and um, it creates some new emotions that start taking over. And then her, she wants to impress this really popular girl and her friends that are good at hockey. They're called the Firehawks, and she wants to become a part of them. So she starts, she develops four new emotions. Uh, Embarrassment, envy... Ennui, which is boredom, just like teenage boredom, you know, like, ugh, do I have to? And, or sarcasm as well. Mm -hmm. And anxiety. And okay, anxiety, played by Maya Hawke in this movie, Maya Hawke of Stranger Things fame and the daughter of Ethan Hawke and Uma Thurman. She does a fantastic job, but anxiety uh, in this movie is basically our accidental villain. But this this movie okay. does this movie does something that a lot of Disney movies have done lately where there is no like true villain villain but what there is is a lot of drama and misunderstanding that leads to someone taking villainous actions even though they're not a bad guy. Okay. Um, you know, think of like movies like Encanto where there is no actual villain but like the conflict is based around family drama. You know, yeah. stuff like that. Um, so that's kind of what we're working with here in the sense that we're base, But unfortunately, what this leads to is basically the same plot as the first movie happening all over again <laughs> in a lot of ways. Yeah. Um, so whereas in the first movie, joy and sadness got separated from the other emotions and had to work their way back and anger, fear and disgust were basically taking over all of Riley's behaviors in this one. The same thing happens, except all of the original emotions get separated, and it's the new emotions that completely take over. So Riley in this movie is being driven almost exclusively by anxiety throughout most of the movie. Mm. Um, And yeah, it's a pretty heavy, pretty hefty metaphor. Uh, But it's... But it's really cool because anxiety's whole thing, she's not trying to do bad... She's trying to do good, but doing it the wrong way. A lot of fear about the future causes a lot of overthinking and overplanning and making mistakes like, you know, uh, basically dismissing her old friends in favor of her new crew and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. Um you know, because she wants to be popular and she, you know, like, oh, no, the, you know, our old friends are really embarrassing and. We can't. So you know, it leads to moments in the movie where li- stuff Riley will like straight up lie about the bands that she likes just to fit in with the popular kids and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. Um, and for any teenager that's ever gone through this, it's extremely relatable. <laughs> um, yeah, 
there are some moments where we jump into the heads of other people too, but they didn't do it as much as the first movie. We see like a moment in her mom's head after Riley hits puberty and she has a freak out about like, Oh God, we knew this day was coming. You know, Mm -hmm. um, you know, there's a little bit with the dad. There is a hilarious moment with one of her friends where, uh, they don't really want to tell her about the school, new school thing because they're, uh, afraid of her reaction, but, and her emotions, one of them accidentally spills some tea on the console, and they're like, oh no, you spilled the tea, and then oh, it zooms no. back out, and and then the girl just tells her everything, and I'm like, that's a funny metaphor, that's hilarious. Uh, <laughs> you know, because, you know, the whole spill the tea means you tell secrets, yeah, right? Yeah. Or like, or like, or like you give the business. Mm-hmm. Um, so... I thought that was pretty funny. Uh, just stuff like that. There's also, like, a part where sarcasm becomes an actual chasm. Like, a chasm that opens up wide. And when you yell across it, anything you say gets translated sarcastically. Mm-hmm. So, like, so like you're like, oh, boy, we're so glad to see you guys. And then on the other end, it's like, oh, boy, we're so glad to see you guys. Uh, I saw that yeah, in the trailer. Like, it has a lot of good stuff like that. Um, and Yeah, the metaphors are on point. I love it. What this one deals with is designing someone's core personality. So Riley has a core personality inside of her that's based off of memories that... Um, Basically, they get they take these memories down an elevator into this pool of water and they put them there and the memories grow a thread that goes up that helps create part of her core personality. Mm-hmm. So her very special core memories design who she is like she's a good person and all that. Mm. Um, and Joy, having learned absolutely nothing from the first movie, is manipulating this so that her core personality is only based on good memories and all of the stinky memories get catapulted off into the stratosphere. (laughs) Um, And uh, it really feels like, since she's doing this in the beginning, it really feels like she didn't learn shit (laughs) in the first movie. Um, So she has to relearn things, too. One of the most depressing yet hard-hitting and accurate lines in the entire movie, she says something along the lines of, Maybe the older you get, the less joy you feel. Ooh. You know? Yeah. And because this is at the later in the movie when Joy starts to realize that anxiety is actually necessary to some degree. She says, maybe you can't, di- maybe you can't beat anxiety. <laughs> maybe you just have to learn how to manage it. God damn. Yep. Yeah, it gets deep That's with that. That's fucking deep, um, man. Yep. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, I definitely felt some things while watching this, and also, uh, there's a vault of secrets, um, uh, where they get locked up in at one point, but this is a vault where Riley keeps all of her deepest, deepest, darkest secrets, and one of them is that she still likes a kid show that she grew up with that's a direct parody of, like, Mickey Mouse Clubhouse or Dora the Explorer, where they, where they talk to the audience, and they're like, they're like, can you see the item we need (laughs) in the background, you know? And then like, he has a, he has a bag named Pouchy. And when he (gasps) needs him, he'll scream, Oh, Pouchy, (laughs) you know, just like the, Oh, toodle thing. Uh, so it's exactly like that. And they actually use this, uh, as a plot device a couple different times to get through different things. Uh, it's pretty fucking fucking funny. Uh, I will say, the ang- the anger character has absolutely no patience for this BS either. <laughs> he, I bet not. Because they're like, he's like, Pouchy, do you have anything that'll help us get out of here? And he's like, boy, let me see. I have an apple, a rubber duck, uh, is like a crayon, <laughs> and, a- and a stick of dynamite. <laughs> and... <laughs> And they look at the camera, he's like, which one do you think will help us get out of here? And Anger's like, oh, for crying out loud, give me the dynamite. <laughs> you know? It's pretty fucking that's great. That's funny. Um, yeah, and they, I, that's one of the things I like about this. They toy with different animation styles. So most of the movie is in the same Pixar animation as the original. But there are moments, so like... Uh, Pouchy and and the guy and the other the dog character and all that they are um 
2D animated, like flat animation, like a cart, like that kind of cartoon really? look. Okay. And there's a video. There's a video game character who looks like he is straight out of a PS2 era video game in okay. there too. Um, as is one of the things. Um, he's in the secret vault because Riley has a crush on him. Oh, uh, okay. Yeah, and just other stuff like that. So they do some creative stuff with the animation. I liked it. Look, it's no Bing Bong, but the side characters were still fun. Hell yeah. Um, so overall, I liked it. I just... My my main issue with it is that it feels like it's basically, for all intents and purposes, just the exact same plot as the first movie, handled differently. Yeah. You know, like, it's literally just the emotions getting thrown out of the tower and having to claw their way back while the negative emotions take over and ruin Riley's life. <laughs> you know? That. Like, it's the exact same thing, uh, just handled differently with new emotions. Mm -hmm. um, but it's still good. I'm not saying it's not good. I'm just saying that that part definitely knocks it down a peg for me just a little bit. Um, but uh, that and the fact that it seems in the beginning like Joy didn't learn anything from the first movie. She did in the terms of how she treats sadness and realizes that sadness is uh, necessary now. But the whole like manipulating Riley's core personality in order to, uh, you know, based off entirely off good memories is was bad because by the end of the movie um you know they've basically learned that riley needs the good and bad memories to be part of her core personality to make up who she mm. is and it goes through this whole montage where she says a bunch of contradicting things but it makes sense because that's how people are well she'll say i'm a good person but i'm flawed i'm kind but i'm mean sometimes you know it's not all good or all bad it's a mix of the two and that's the lesson here Mm -hmm. Is that, you know, that that's part of the message of the movie overall um, is that, you know, it's uh, is that it's OK to be flawed. Mm -hmm. It's OK to be it's, you know, it's about how you handle it. Yeah. Um, you know, there's beauty in the cracks, that kind of thing. So definitely a good movie well, overall, though, because because of the few caveats I mentioned, I would give it a. Eight out of ten. Eight out of ten. Would be my score. Okay. Yeah. Yep. That's fair. Yep. That is. That's what I am going with. I think I gave the first one a nine out of ten. So you know, uh, but I do think this is a franchise with a lot of potential for longevity because of the vast multitude of emotions they can pull from and different ages that Riley can hit that they can work with. So. Like, I guarantee you the next one is probably, like, she's, like, either 16 or 18. Yeah, or something like that. You know? Yeah. Also, there is, they didn't have a Pixar short before this, but there is one on Disney Plus you can watch called Riley's First Date. I think I have seen that one. So that is, yeah, that's a lead up into the movie itself. Okay. Makes sense. So... Yep, so that's my uh, first of two things. I am assuming you're going to review the movie you saw in theaters here. Yes. Uh, we went to go see Despicable Me 4. And I know the trailer showcases the minions a lot. However... They, uh, there's only really three, the three main minions are the ones that are the more consistent <laughs> in the, in the movie. But they all have superpowers, right? They're getting into <laughs> shenanigans with that. No. Not all of them have superpowers. But there was only, there was only five. There was only five. Give it. So I would have to go into spoiler territory, and I don't want to do that, considering how new this movie is. You can't really spo spoil a Despicable Me movie. It's a formulaic child's movie. <laughs> That's fair. Okay, so basically. Gru goes to his school reunion. 
meets up with an old classmate. Now, in this, I want to say in Despicable Me 3 is when Gru joined the... The anti-villain agency. It it might be. I think it's whichever one Kristen Wiig's character came in in. Because um, I don't know if I've ever seen the third one, but I do know that he finds his brother in that one. Yes. Um... This classmate of Gru's reveals something about himself. Okay. And Gru places him under arrest. And then basically he because this villain slash classmate of Gru's escaped prison and is now after Gru, Gru and his family now have to be put into a witness protection program. Okay. And the age, the anti-villain agency uh, basically uh has a facility where they can store or basically uh, um, house all of the other minions while the three main minions are in the house with Gru and his family. Okay. And it's fucking hilarious. I just remember from the trailers seeing that some of the minions get superpowers and oh, get yeah, no. shen shenanigans with them. Oh yeah, no, no, that that did happen. That did happen. That was in the facility uh, that houses the rest of the minions. There was like, there was like, I need five. They were like, they were like, we need we need five great volunteers to come forth, and there was like five minions right there in the row and then the rest of them that were behind them all stepped back and started giggling and then once once uh they realized what was going on they weren't giggling so so much because they then wanted the superpowers it was hilarious <laughs> nice it was funny so overall with this movie what did you what did you really I, like? And was there anything you didn't like? The one thing... Okay, so... The one thing that... Bothered me as a parent... Nothing negative about the movie. It was just something that the villain did in the movie. Like, the villain of this movie, like, targeted... Gru's newborn son mm. kid wanted to kidnap his newborn son just to get back at Gru. Like, as a parent, I wouldn't wish that on my worst enemy. Right. Yeah, so the villain did something villainous to, pay, yeah. to make them be, be hated. That was, you know, that makes sense. I, yeah. Um, but is there anything about the um just the movie overall itself the, that you The didn't, movie like... overall? No, I mean I loved it. I mean that okay. that's my only that's my only caveat. Okay, so no 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 problems with the pacing or No, any, no, or, it was fucking or any, honestly or any of the jokes being cringy or anything like that. No, not at all. No, it was all it was it was great. It was hilarious. Yeah. In fact, I found myself laughing more than my daughter. <laughs> nice. Okay. Yeah, no, it's it was it was it was a cute movie. I'd give it an eight out of ten. Oh, okay. 
I'm guessing that eight is just based on it just being a kid's movie. Yes. Not that it does anything wrong, but also it doesn't go above and beyond either. Yes, that. Okay. Because I've definitely rated some kids' movies like nines and tens, but those are like really special movies. Yeah, no, this, like, this was an eight out of ten. I'd say for me, the original Lion King is probably like a 10 out of 10. Oh, movie. hell yeah. Agreed 100%. But okay. I'm glad that you enjoyed it. Yeah, and That's I'm a, it's... really glad. Again, I'm really glad that my daughter did really good with uh, the movie theaters. Like that, 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 that shows, that tells me that there's some, there's, there's some kids' movies that are coming out later this year. Like, we got Moana 2 coming out in November. We've got Sonic the Hedgehog 3 coming out in December. These are movies, oh, yeah. these are movies that we could take my daughter to go <laughs> see if she's, well, if she's well enough behaved. Yeah, and not a kids' movie, but a brief reminder that Deadpool and Wolverine comes out at the end of this one. Exactly! I can't wait. It, oh, so, and my drink cup that I that I I ended up getting a Mister Pib with my with my with my with my snack. Mm-hmm. Um, and I got the large cup, and it had Deadpool and Wolverine on the cup. Nice. It wasn't a souvenir okay. cup, but it was a a paper cup by that was that that was made by Cinemark. I'm just excited that we're getting the long-awaited uh, rematch between uh, Wolverine and Sabretooth in this movie. I can't wait! Uh, yeah. So that's... Ugh. Oh, I can't that's wait. That's gonna be fun. You and I are definitely gonna have to go see that, like, right when it comes out so we can do a spoiler cast. Yes. Yeah, so... agree. Budget for that one. Plan for it. Make it a priority. <laughs> Yes, I will definitely need to talk to... to, Well, yes. (laughs) Yeah. Definitely. Yes. We'll uh, we'll have to... I'll have to make that happen. For sure. Okay. So, well, on the the note of Marvel and superheroes, I actually... So my, my... My second and final thing for this and our final Media Corner entry overall this episode is... Uh, I very recently, and this is a little bit older, came out in like 2019, I want to say, but I finally just got around to playing it. Maybe 2020, I don't remember for sure, but finally got around to playing and finishing it this year. But I finally finished one of the games on my New Year's resolution checklist, and that was the Guardians of the Galaxy video game. Oh, how was it? It was amazing. Um... Nice. I really loved it. So it is a real-time action RPG game where you play as Star-Lord throughout the whole thing, and you have okay. the other Guardians, Gamora, Rocket, and Groot, and Drax as party members, and each of them mm-hmm. each of them has, like... So they they completely act and fight on their own, but they all have special abilities that if you hold R1 and pull up this menu, uh, for each of them, you can choose one of their abilities to have them use like you can give them direct commands and have them use certain abilities in combat Mm -hmm. and then you know there's like a cooldown timer before they can use another one and (laughs) and peter has his own abilities too that you can also activate Mm -hmm. and so the plot here is basically like they go to a um go to a planet in a quarantine zone looking for something that they can sell for money. They're hunting down, but they Mm -hmm. accidentally awaken and activate this, um, this, uh, I don't even know what to call it. Evil life force that looks like a bunch of nano spiky nanobots. (laughs) It's very weird, but okay. It basically lives inside the soul stone and they accidentally activate it. And, um, well, one thing leads to another, and um, they get arrested by the Nova Corps. But then there's an attack on the base by a uh, by a religious sect um, led by this guy named Raker. And basically, the story becomes about taking Raker down before he can uh, eliminate the galaxy. So 
they kidnap this young half human half Cree girl named Nikki who may or may not be Peter's daughter and um she becomes possessed by the by the evil sentient being and it becomes about a trip to go about saving her and the galaxy simultaneously um and mm -hmm. Pe Peter struggling with the fact that if if he can't save his daughter then he might have to do the unthinkable to save the galaxy, you know, like because okay. of her being possessed by this creature. Um, mm -hmm. But it's your typical Guardians flair at this point in the story. Thanos is already dead, but they do kind of deal with like a memory flashback of him. Uh, mm -hmm. Nebula is also dead. So Gamora is going through a lot of mixed emotions throughout the story. Um it's it's guardians it's comedy a lot of comedy like a lot of hilarious lines when you're running around different levels there's a lot of funny banter between the characters that's really good um and it gives you dialogue options to choose what peter says uh during those moments as well and during cutscenes and it's not the kind of game where your choices change the ending in any meaningful way but it is the kind of game where your choices can affect certain aspects of the story like for example when you go to do the final showdown and you show up at the base of the of the villains and you're flying in cuz there are a couple of like spaceship combat sections in this too um all of the people that you've helped and made friends with throughout the game will show up to help you at the end if you're on their good side. But it mm -hmm. it, re it requires you to have done specific things and made specific dialogue options throughout um, mm -hmm. in order to get them on your side. But yeah, you've got Lady Hellbender and the giant dragon Fing Fang Foom. You've got uh, Cosmo, the space dog, is in this as well. Nice. Uh, the Collector is here. He's got a whole museum that you can pay to go in and look around. Um, mm -hmm. yeah, you go to nowhere, the big empty celestial head that they go to a lot, uh, mm -hmm. from the movies. So, and this is a completely original story too. It's, it's not based directly off any comic story. It's not based on the movies. It's a completely original standalone new story. Um, and the soundtrack to this game, 80s nostalgia out the wazoo, quite frankly, like, the, okay. the the game literally opens with a song by Iron Maiden, and you're playing as a young Peter in his bed in his bedroom, uh, listening to it, and you get to see his mom and stuff. And there's a lot of flashbacks to Peter's childhood in here uh, as well. Um, okay. And you, you walk around his bedroom, his like '80s bedroom, and there's so much nostalgia. There's like posters for like Star mm -hmm. Star Wars and shit. Uh, yes. He's got a Chewbacca action figure. Um, so yeah. Uh, and that Chewbacca action figure comes back a lot in this game. Um, Does it? Oh yeah, yeah. Uh, the nice. game has the game has collectibles and stuff too. Uh, you know, in certain levels, the, the, it's a very linear, straightforward game, so it's pretty much impossible to get lost or stuck. Because even if you do, the other characters will start berating you and pointing out where you're supposed to go and calling you a dumbass. So, <laughs> um, they're like, hey. Quill, over here, maybe I could go climb in this, you know, that kind of thing. Um, so, uh, and combat-wise, I didn't find it too difficult either. Like, I think you would really enjoy this game. Um, mm -hmm. but, but as you're going through, there are some places, some areas off the beaten path, like if you climb up to the right area or take a little side path, there are collectibles you can find, including different outfits you can equip on the characters that you can find in these chests. Little, um, little data pads that you can pick up and read that give you more, like, lore and backstory on what's going on. And, um, specific items, mm -hmm. like, collectible items that have, that have significance to each of your party members, like, history-wise. So when you find mm -hmm. them on a level, every, between every few levels, you go back to your ship and mm -hmm. you have and you have time to walk around and talk to your party members before going to the next level. And during these moments, some of those collectibles you found, if you go into the Guardian's bedrooms and pick them up and look at them, it'll unlock extra dialogue with that Guardian, and they'll come talk to you about what that item is, what it means to them, and then you can, like, prod them for more information about it, too, and have, like, a mm -hmm. whole ass, like, five-minute conversation about it. Yeah, yes. and it's really cool. Um, yeah. 
it's uh it's got all the guardians humor all the actors uh sound on point um you know, and if some of the outfits you can unlock in this are the outfits from the Guardians movies, like the the MCU ones. Nice. Uh, if you want to equip them, and each like, um, each outfit comes with like a blurb about it. You can read that where that gives that character's opinion on the outfit and its origin. It explains where it comes from, and each outfit, except for the ones from the movies, all the other ones are straight up from different comic book stories. Nice. Like. Each character has, like, a Four Horsemen of the Apocalypse uh, outfit that makes them look evil, and that's from a from a comic storyline that they did at one point, among other things. They all have a Nova Corps outfit. They all have uh, all kinds of shit. Um, so, I really enjoyed it overall. Um, I don't really have a whole lot of caveats, except that I think it does go on a little bit too long. It's a, it's, it's a surprisingly long game. I think it was probably like 40 hours by the time I finished it. But uh, it's also technically an RPG, so that kind of makes sense. But uh, there are some moments where it does feel like they're padding the runtime with stupid nonsense just to make it drag on longer. Uh, what would you and rate some, it? Uh, oh, I'm not done yet. Uh, no. Some of the character banter can get a little tedious at times, especially when they start repeating the same shit over and over again. Um, the character banter is simultaneously one of the best aspects of the game while also being one of the most detrimental aspects of it. <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah. Um, uh, cause sometimes it's great and other times it's horrible. So, um, you know, uh, keeping in line with everything, this is going to be another eight out of 10. That's going to be, uh, it's okay. an eight out of 10 for me. All right. Um, I mean, and also, like, that's three eights in a row, and there's your slot machine wins right there. Yeah. <laughs> bar, bar, bar. Ding, 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 ding. Here's 70 hundred quarters. <laughs> uh, so, yep. That's another eight out of ten for me. So that is our media corner, yes. folks. Three reviews, three eight out of tens. That's all of your... Um, Inside Out 2 is, I think, currently still in theaters, and if it's yes. not, I'm sure it'll hit Disney Plus sometime in the next few months. Despicable Me 4 is currently in theaters, and um, Guardians of the Galaxy can be purchased and played on most modern gaming platforms. Yes. So, and I think it might even be free on PS Plus Extra, but don't quote me on that. Uh, so... All right, with all that being said, time for the topic. Yeah. You know, I don't even know why I agreed to do this show. This is just so not me. I, I would much rather just be home listening to my old jazz records. Really? God, you know, I, I actually have quite a jazz collection myself. What do you like? Oh, DJ Jazzy Jeff. Oh. All right, everybody, here we are at the topic, which this time is all about music and soundtracks from the media that we love. The, yes. uh... The songs, the sounds, and uh, everything in between. Tell me, uh, Nick, do you recognize this little ditty? It goes a little something like... <clears throat> That's Mario. <laughs> that's that's the Mario. Oh, theme. I thought. I did not get Mario from that. I am so sorry. <laughs> <laughs> and that's exactly how that theme goes. And then when they go underground, it's. Yeah, I've. 
I've got a lot of this music, like, it's mm. stuck in my head. <laughs> you know? Um, but yeah. Uh, <coughs> yeah, the Mario Diddy, uh, pretty recognizable. Yeah, I've got so much of it. Um, but since we're on, yeah, let's start with video games anyways. When you think of, uh, your favorite music from a, from video games that you've played, what's one of the first things that comes to you? Kingdom Hearts. Oh yeah, I hardcore have to agree with that. Mm -hmm. Yoko, Shimomo Yoko Shimomura is a fantastic composer. She really does a lot of good piano stuff. It's like, yes. you'll notice several tracks throughout the Kingdom Hearts franchise have a lot of piano in them, and that's 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 definitely one of her key things, the piano in her music. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, there I've played some of the like the first two games, like Kingdom Hearts one and two, at least so much that at this point you could play me any song, like any musical piece from the soundtrack of the game, and uh, I would know immediately where it was from, like what world or level or what cutscene, mm -hmm. you know basically um you know and it, it, that's another thing i've heard it all so much that i can basically mimic those too of course like you know uh, for a you know i'm not an instrument i'm just a person so i can only you know it's like ski bop it or hum it but mm -hmm. um shit i still remember one of the boss battle themes from the first game called shrouding dark cloud it plays the first time you fight the guard armor in traverse town when you first meet donald and goofy okay and it uh it goes a little something like yeah it it They've got stuff like that. Um, or, uh, what's the music from Wonderland? Yeah, all the music is perfectly fitting of each of the worlds and shit it belongs to, too. Like, Wonderland, you've got this, like, trilly, upbeat, fantasy, like, flowery music. Almost like, almost like a Fantasia-esque orchestral sound to it. Mm -hmm. Right? You know? And it's very, like, boom, bum, boom, bum. You know, that uh, it's very floaty, very mm -hmm. floaty in music. But then when enemies, when enemies show up, the music changes. In every world, every world has a main theme and a battle theme. When enemies show up, it's like a, a more fast paced version of the main theme for each of these worlds and it still fits you know and this one enemies show up and it goes yeah uh, more fast paced um and that's the case with everything you know you go to agrabah and you have um um you know the like Arabian desert music that plays. And I love how in um, Atlantica and Halloween Town, the music that plays is just an instrumental rendition of their theme songs. Mm -hmm. in, Atl in Atlantica, it's a, a, re a musical, like an instrumental version of Under the Sea. So it's just all like... You know? Mm -hmm. Bump. Bum bum ba dum da 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 bum bum ba dum yeah, um, and in Halloween Town it's the this is Halloween theme. Exactly, exactly. Um, and they knew how to make the emotional moments have great like soft paced music. Kyrie has three different themes in the first game, and each one is just like a very like. M melodious almost like I want to say like flute music mm -hmm. I would call it um yeah like a like a like a soft whistle <laughs> uh with with very clear like piano music in the background too mm -hmm. um and stuff like that yeah they just did such a great job at it uh 
And some of the tracks in those games just absolutely fucking slap. Like, uh, in Kingdom Hearts 2, a lot of the boss battle music against the organization members, in particular, uh, really stands out. Um, so you mentioned it being, like, one of your, your top games for music-wise. What is, like, and you don't have to know the names of the tracks or anything, but you can just say, like, you know, I really like the, the main theme of this particular world or something like that. Like, what's your favorite music from these games? I'd have to say, of? um, like, the Mickey Mouse March. Oh, yep, that one plays, um, in a cutscene in the first game, but when you first visit Disney Castle in the second game, it plays in the courtyard area. I'm trying to find audio for that so I can make Oh, we know so what, I can make we, so I can make it into a ringtone so I can set it as my dad's ringtone. Oh, nice. Okay. Yeah, I was going to say I think we all know that one. It starts with the 20th Century Fox drum roll. Uh that. And, it sure does. Yeah. Yeah, bump bump. Bum bum ba dum dum and then it goes into the diddle Yep. Yep. Yeah, they uh they did good. Some of the the songs in these game or music in these games is definitely just renditions of the you know, like Hundred Acre Wood has the, you know, Winnie the Pooh theme playing as its main theme. Um stuff like that. But um I really like when they go for originality with the tracks, too, but everything always fits, and it's like every song in the game is almost a different genre yeah. of music, but it all fits, and it's all being done with a full-ass orchestra. At least in the newer games, it's an orchestra. Yeah. Um, but for the remasters, that's the other thing, too. For the remasters, like on the PS3 and then 4 that they did, they went back and re-recorded the entire soundtrack for the older games with an orchestra. Nice. Um, so the music in those games has been completely what they call reorchestrated. Nice. Uh, in the remasters. Yeah, because uh, a lot of those, they did the same thing with the Final Fantasy X HD remaster because a lot of those original files on the PS2 games are what we call MIDI files, M-I-D-I, which were like highly compressed music files that didn't take up too much space because they had limited room on the discs. Um, and they were, it was digitally created music for the most part, okay. you know. Um, you know, the next step up from beeps and boops. <laughs> uh, but it still like sounded like genuine music, but then for the remasters, they've completely went back and like re recorded those songs with a full orchestra. Yeah. So, yeah, I just want to say Final Fantasy games also have some amazing music, very memorable music, some of the best soundtracks in gaming history, quite frankly. And Square Enix in general, if there's one thing they get right in every single game they make, it's the soundtrack. Mm -hmm. Even with every, if any, anything else, if anything else they mess up, it's the soundtrack they get right. I'll say the only Final Fantasy game where I never, com like, the first time I played it, I didn't fully like the soundtrack was Final Fantasy 13 2, but they, they did some weird things with that one. Like, some of the songs in that, some of the music in that game has lyrics. And there's like a few a few pop songs, a few rap songs, and even one heavy metal song in there. So, okay. Yeah. Uh, that one, so they're different colored chocobos. When you ride, when you get on a red chocobo, it, the heavy metal music starts playing, and there's a full song in it. It's like, -na 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 -na. it's like a, like a heavy metal cover of the chocobo theme. And then they start singing, they're like, so you want to ride this chocobo? You know, and, um, it, it's fucking wild. I love um, it. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, there's that that one. I grew to appreciate the soundtrack to that one more over time. But uh, shout out to the, compo the main composer behind all the Final Fantasy games, Nobu Uematsu, who is also doing the music for one of the upcoming JRPGs that we saw during the Nintendo Showcase, um, which is also going to be a Square Enix game, too. So uh, so expect that one, if nothing else, to have amazing music in it. Yes. I, for 
I forget which game it is, but whichever one was the Square Enix game, probably, would be yes. that one. Um, what are some other video games you really like the soundtrack to? Uh... You find the music very memorable, uh, or even nostalgic if it's an older game. Ooh. Like, if you hear the music playing, but you don't see the game, but you hear the music, you immediately know what it's from. I don't know. I think Sonic and Mario would both be pretty easy answers. Their music is unmistakable. Yeah, I'd say so, yeah, yeah. Especially the first levels. Yes. Um, yeah, I, uh... I went through a lot of, uh... I, I did these videos on YouTube for a while where someone had the guess the video game music quiz and you, they'd play a snippet of the music and you had, like, ten seconds to guess what game it was from before it showed you. Mm -hmm. Um... You know what music I would always recognize immediately if I heard it playing? What's is, that? Uh, the main theme of the first Spyro game. Ooh, yeah. That's another good one. Yeah, uh... Yeah, that one always stood out to me immediately. And not all of these, I can't mimic all of them, because some of them are just, like, way too involved for that. But, like, mm -hmm. in my in my head, I can hear it, and, like, if I heard it play, I would immediately be like, Ooh, yeah, 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 I know this. I know what this is from. You know, mm -hmm. so... Some games are a little harder, because, you know, there's, like, a lot of horror games and stuff where they don't really have a soundtrack. I mean, they do, but their soundtrack just basically boils down to, like tense, soft build-up music, like, slow, like, duh. Mm-hmm. You know, like, that, you know, it's not, like, exciting stuff. It's, like, it's, like, mellow and creepy music. Um, or you have, like, the violin swills when they are building up to something. You know, you get the violins in there a lot. Or uh, if you're being chased by a monster, then the violin goes fucking ham, <laughs> you know? <laughs> I don't know if it would constitute as a soundtrack, but but a song from a game. Yes. Oh, oh Death from uh, the uh, Dark Pictures Anthology games and um, Until Dawn. Yep, that's a good one. I have, um, I actually have, like, on my... YouTube channel, like, a top ten, like, games from and inspired, or songs from and inspired by video games. Um, so, yeah, if, as far as lyrical songs from games, I've got quite a few. There's, um, the songs from both of the Portal games, uh, Still mm -hmm. Alive and, and Want You Gone. Um. Okay. There's, R, there's RE, colon, Your Brains from Left 4 Dead 2. Um. That one's really good because it's just it's a song you can find on a jukebox in the game and play it. And it's Jonathan Colton singing a song about from the perspective of the zombies wanting to come in and eat the brains of the people in the. But it's like them doing like a love ballad to convince them to come out and get eaten. <laughs> uh, mm -hmm. It's pretty fucking great. Uh, and the chorus is like. You know? <laughs> yep. Maybe we're at an impasse here. Maybe we should compromise. <laughs> uh, it's fucking great. Uh, I love it. Um, it's one of those goofy songs that takes itself seriously, which makes it even funnier. Um, <clears throat> I also really like uh, the opening theme song to Metal Gear Solid 3. It's called uh, Snake Eater by Cynthia Harrell, and it sounds exactly like the kind of music you'd hear in the opening of a James Bond movie. It's got that, like, 70s spy thriller vibe to it. You know, with, like, all the like the trumpets and the horns and the dun-dun-dun-na kind of thing going for it. Um, mm -hmm. It's fucking amazing. Like, it, it was intentionally designed to be that way, mm -hmm. and they, they absolutely nail the the, the sound nice. um, in that. So, uh, Honor for All from the ending credits of Dishonored is another good one, too. That one okay. picks up quite a bit. I really like that one. Um, nice. And obviously, gotta mention the opening and closing theme songs to each and every Kingdom Hearts game. Mm -hmm. Uh 
all by Yuta- Yutada Hikaru. We've got Simple and Clean, Sanctuary, and Face Your Fears. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, then also the ending versions of Simple and Clean and Sanctuary, but a different song for the ending of Kingdom Hearts 3 called Don't Think Twice. Um, all fantastic songs. She's great. And uh, Final Fantasy X had an uh, opening song called Other World by uh, Bill Murr. And uh, then there is the kissing scene song as well mm. uh, called Isn't It Wonderful? <clears throat> yeah, and those are all fantastic. Yeah. Uh, video games Video games often have lyrical songs in them that are amazing. Oh, ah, fucking hell. I would... Uh, be an absolute fool if I talked about lyrical songs in video games and didn't mention the old gods of Asgard. Uh, I was just gonna say, dude. Yeah, Herald because of Darkness, they in, man. They are in every single Remedy game with a <laughs> new song in each one. They were in the first Alan Wake with Children of the Elder God and Poet in the Muse. They were in Control with Take Control. Um, they were in... Um, Alan Wake's American Nightmare with Balance Slays the Demon. They had not one, not two, but three songs in Alan Wake 2, including Herald of Darkness, uh, Anger's Remorse, and um, Dark Ocean Summoning. Okay. Uh, Yep, yep. And then on the album that they recently released, they have an exclusive song on there that isn't in any of the games, but it is like part of the lore. And it, again, it's worth mentioning that the Old Gods of Asgard is a fictional band that exists, exists in the game universe, but they are portrayed by a real band called Poets of the Fall, yeah. who also have their own separate songs in Remedy games, too. Okay. So, yeah, because there's a part in Control where there's a secret room you can find, and it's like a recording studio, and if you hit the play button, it plays a whole Poets of the Fall song called My Darkest Desire. Okay. Yeah, really good shit. Um, And then, of course, in my review earlier, I mentioned that Guardians of the Galaxy game is just filled to the brim with an 80s soundtrack. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, there's moments in that game where your characters huddle up, and if you say the right thing, everyone will get a boost in battle. And then and Peter puts on a song on his Walkman, and it's always like some 80s song. Nice. Um, I've I've heard, like, music by Def Leppard and... um, Oh, God, all kinds. I I can't even list them all. There's so many in there. Um, I'm pretty sure the game Rick rolled me at one point because that song. (laughs) Uh, Yeah. So, that's one of the options. Okay. So, yeah. Yeah. Uh, Video games have fantastic soundtracks. I know I mentioned that the the soundtrack to horror isn't always, like, very memorable, but what it is is very effective in building the atmosphere and the scenery to get you in the right mood and feeling for where you are. Like, Mm -hmm. um, I will say a lot of the tension building in horror, the background music has a lot to do with that sometimes because the music can evoke emotions in people. That's why during sad scenes in movies and stuff, they're always playing sad music because they want to, uh, they're trying to force that cry out of you, you know? Uh, using basically you know there's psychological stuff to it music can be affecting in that way it can yeah uh, affect your emotions yes yeah, it can you know? uh you know and there's kind of a science behind the right way to use it and where to implement certain audio cues to like emotionally manipulate the audience yeah that <laughs> uh and they're really good at that in a lot of things and how they do it um but yeah, I love me a, uh, you know, I love me a good, a good atmospheric horror game, and a lot of the music does play to that quite yes. a bit. I will say though, there is one piece of music from a horror game series that everyone does immediately recognize, and that is the save room music from Resident Evil, because uh, it's pretty universal across the whole series, and anytime you're in a safe room, this very heavenly, soft and safe music plays that's almost kind of like a gentle harp, mm-hmm. and 
it's just a, a way to let you know that there's nothing to worry about right now and you're safe in this room. But the moment you leave, the nice music goes away and everything gets spooky oh, again. <laughs> so, so that's probably why it's so memorable because it's such a juxtaposition from everything else that you're used to. Yeah. You know? So. Um, okay. Why don't you carry us into where we're going to go next with the soundtrack discussion? It was your idea, after all. So what is it you really want to talk ah, about? It doesn't have to be video video games anymore. It's just okay. whatever. I, um... Would be amiss if I didn't mention the soundtrack for, uh... A little show called Has Been Hotel... <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I do believe after watching the the first season of that show a couple times, I listened to the soundtrack on. Dude, for I've quite got a bit songs there. from that from that show on my workflow playlist that I listen to on an at an on, on a nightly basis at work. I hear Poison, Loser Baby, more than anything, and uh. Hell's Greatest Dad all on a nightly basis. God, I love Hell's <laughs> Greatest Dad. That one's so good. That's such a fun song. Oh, and song. Happy Day in Hell, too. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's a fun one, too. Um, <laughs> yeah, I listened to that quite a bit. God, I just... Yeah, we mentioned it before in that review episode, but I just love um, how... Pretty much every song in there is, you know, going back and rewatching Family Guy the way I have, it kind of gives me that similar vibe where every song is almost, with the exception of a few that are definitely designed mm -hmm. after pop songs, but a lot of them, a lot of them feel like they're meant to be show tunes. Yeah. Um, like what Family Guy does. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I picked up on that vibe and I'm like, yeah, these songs are like Disney parodies and show tunes. Uh, <laughs> mm -hmm. For the most part, with the exception of a few uh, songs, um, like res uh, the Respected, I think it is, that one. And po Respectless. Respectless and Poison are both like meant to be pop songs, for yeah. sure. Um, but otherwise, yeah. Yeah. Uh, and uh, Loser Baby's got kind of a jazz vibe to it, I would say. Little bit, yeah, I would say that, yeah. I could agree with that. Um, but it still feels like the kind of song you would hear in a musical. Uh, yeah. It, singing in the rain, just a singing mm -hmm. in the rain. <laughs> um, yes. Yeah. Yes. Uh, but, um, yeah. Uh, they they put such good work into those songs, though. Um, yes, they did. Welcome Home is a pretty good one too. I think that's what it's called. Uh, the Vox versus Alistair song. Yes, Welcome Home. Yep, I really like that one too. Uh, oh no, uh, stay uh, stayed gone, no. stayed gone, S stayed gone, S stayed gone. Yeah, it's yeah, stayed gone. Yes, yes. Um, I think we established it before, but your favorite song from that is Poison, is it? Uh, it's a toss-up between Poison and Loser Baby. That's fair. For me, I think it was between Poison and Hell's Greatest Dad. <laughs> so, fair, okay. Hell's Greatest Dad would probably win out if it wasn't for that Mimsy part at the end. <laughs> <laughs> Mimsy. Um, well, speaking of show tunes, uh... Family Guy has a illustrious soundtrack. Uh, yes, they do. Oh, but the thing, the thing about them is that almost every song they do is either exactly the song itself from an old show tune, or it's a parody of such, like or from yes. from a musical. Like in season two, episode one, Peter Peter Caviar Eater, they move into a mansion. Um, that Lois's aunt leaves to her and they're like living rich and they do a song called this house is freaking sweet. And, um, fucking Peter sells their home in Quahog. Yes. And they do that. But 
that whole song is a parody and it's in the exact same tune and everything to I think I'm going to like it here from the musical Annie. Oh, yep. Yep. And that's the same for almost all their show tunes. Like the bag of weed song uh, is also a show tune are you, parody. Arguably my favorite song in the series. Yep. Yep. Um, and then the, the Shapoopy song that Peter did uh, during the the when he got that touchdown, and all that that is just straight up word for word. The exact same song that Groucho Marx sang in an old show tune uh like literally the exact same song he didn't change any of the lyrics at all he just sings the song um okay and that's the case for some things too like in the uh you can't who new phone who dis and you can't handle the booth when peter gets his head stuck in the banner in the stairs he just straight up sings the same song that kermit's or kermit's uh nephew robin sang on the muppet show halfway down the stairs Okay. Yep. It's just like word for word the same song. So sometimes they do that. You know, there's a few moments like there's a part where Chris goes to live in the jungle for a while and he falls in love with a girl out there. And as part of the mating ritual dance, he sings, uh, Wake me up before you go, go. Don't leave me hanging on like a yo-yo. You know, that song. Um, and mm-hmm. he, he just straight up sings that song. <laughs> so, mm-hmm. Yeah. So there are some songs in there that that's, um, but they do have originals and they have so many originals and they're done in different styles. I will say the one time Family Guy stepped out of the show tunes style and did something different was when they actually did a K-pop song. <laughs> um, uh-huh. Yeah, there was an episode called Candy Quahog Marshmallow where the, the guys, Peter, Cleveland, Joe and Quagmire go to Korea to find a missing episode of a Korean soap opera they've been watching and getting into. And Quagmire rekindles an old flame while he's out there and ends up staying. And the guys are like, no, you can't stay out here. You got to come back to America with us. So they sing a K-pop song to convince him of why America is better than Korea and why he shouldn't stay and should come home. <laughs> uh, okay. It, it's fucking great. See, if you haven't seen that episode either, then that song's going to be new to you, too, when you watch the third video <laughs> that I said. Yes. Sent you. Yep. Um, yeah, they're like, they're like, who wants to live in Korea? Their name sounds like gonorrhea. <laughs> they're, like, they're like, come on, come on, come on home. Quahog is your home, boy. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Okay. Yes. Yeah, so they they sing a straight up K-pop song. Some of my favorite, like I'll I'll tell you, I'm up, I'm with you. The bag of weed song is great. Um, the freaking FCC song is one of the top tier mm-hmm. for sure. Shapoopy, obviously. Um, yes, Mr. Booze, that one's really good. That one's got um, H. John Benjamin in it doing a bit too as Carl. Um, <laughs> you know Archer okay. and Bob. Archer and Bob. Uh, yep. He's, uh, cause during the Mr. Boo song, there's different parts where different characters get up and testify about how alcohol ruined their life. And when Carl comes up and does his bit, he's like, I used to be a soda pop guy and then I switched to the bottle. Now I don't leave my house and I've seen every movie ever made, <laughs> you know? <sighs> and that's him. That's, that's Bob and Archer, that guy right there. Um, yeah. So, same, same voice actor. Um, there's actually a joke about that. In one episode, there's an episode where a bunch of characters are doing stand-up comedy or doing, like, a talent show or something, and Carl gets up there, and he's like, I'm gonna do impressions, and he's like, this is Bob from Bob's Burgers. Hi, I'm Bob. And he's like, now this is that guy Archer from Archer. Hi, I'm Archer. Here's what it would sound like if they met, hi, Bob, hi, Archer, thank you, (laughs) you know, and it's just him (laughs) doing his voice the whole time. Uh, it's fucking great little uh, little fourth wall nod to the voice actor. He hasn't been on the show in a long time though, so he, you know he must uh right uh, must be busy with other stuff. But um, or maybe one too many Bob's Burgers jokes and they, he just <laughs> walked, you know. Uh, but yeah, Mister Booze is up there for me. Tinder makes you gross is a good one where Quagmire becomes addicted to Tinder and 
he becomes he becomes like a freaking like a golem creature hiding in his house. He grows a beard. Every, he hasn't done the dishes in weeks. They take his phone away to get him unaddicted. And so he's like they come in and he's sitting in the dark by himself swiping on the microwave screen trying to get matches <laughs> because oh, he's Jesus. So, so addicted. So they sing a song about how Tinder makes you gross and stuff like that. Um, Jeez. You know. And it's 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 another show too, and then Peter's you know they got stuff like Peter's like, and for kids it's kinds of tragic because now sex has lost its magic. They're banging every dick in Tom and Jane. <laughs> <You know? laughs> it's fucking great. Jeez. Uh, uh, and um, then uh. Uh, Thank the Whites is a hilarious one where Peter's trying to convince his friend Jerome about all the good things that white people have brought us, but then it all just turns out to be, like, bad, <laughs> like, really bad mm-hmm. stuff. Um, or, like, really annoying shit <laughs> uh, mm-hmm. that just makes him more mad. It's great. Um, it's also one of their shortest songs they've ever done. Like, normally they go a lot longer, but with this one it was short just so they could make this joke at the end where Jerome's like, that song just made me hate white people even more. And Peter's like, what about eight more verses? (laughs) (laughs) It's sort of a self-deprecation joke on how long their songs go sometimes. Yes. Uh, There's a couple of DVD exclusive songs, including Me and Jesus and Stewie's Little List, that I really like. Yes. Yeah. Um... I remember the Stewie's me- little list. Yes, that one is from the Stewie kills or Stewie kills Lois, then Lois kills Stewie special that they did. But um, that particular song was cut from the TV version for Time, and they kept. But it's in the DVD version. But yeah, I like that one because Stewie's going around talking about all the people who annoy him that he'd like to punish. Uh, yes. Yeah, that's a that's a real fun one. So. Yeah, a lot of great songs in the uh, Family Guy uh, lineup. There was an episode recently where the the family hired this girl named Alana to help Lois with the housework. Um, But she started becoming attached to the family and tried to take them over. And Brian goes to confront her at one point about her behavior. And she starts manipulating him. And then Mm -hmm. she she starts playing the piano and they start singing a song together that is definitely word for word a song from an old show tune. Um, Okay. Yeah. And... uh, it's one of those, like, I'll be loving you when cloudy days or summer hugging you. You know, that kind of uh, thing. Uh-huh. And, you know, and it's like, even when your kiss can no longer pack a thrill, I'll still be loving you. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, so they did one of those numbers, and um, yeah, they just had a lot of great stuff like that. Uh yeah, Family Guy has the songs. Um, American Dad has some good ones, too. Not as many memorable ones to me, but they're like, the guy who plays Steve, Scott Grimes, he can sing. Like, you wouldn't think that Steve's singing voice would be good because of how he he normally sounds, you know, nasally and high-pitched mm-hmm. and screechy like a nerd. But when he sings, he sounds really good. Nice. Um Steve is the best singer on the show by far. Um, and he's got some, there are some really good American dad songs. Uh, I remember there was an episode where all the boys joined a boy band called B12 and they put out their first single and they were like, it was just like, you know, like a backstreet boys or something like that style song. And, you know, they even go through a montage where they introduce all the, all the band members and, the, the chorus is like, girl, you need a shot of B12. You know you do. Yeah, that kind of thing. Mm-hmm. Um, the B12 stood for Boys 12 because it was a band of 12 boys. Uh, but yeah, American Dad has some good songs. Matter of fact, there was an episode, a, a Halloween special hot tub episode where um, the they bought a hot tub that uh, was sentient and it was voiced by CeeLo Green, so the whole episode was a musical. <laughs> Which I thought was pretty cool. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so besides, um, circling back though, besides the Bag of Weed song, what uh, what are some of your top Family Guy songs? Like, your, uh, like, besides the Bag of Weed song, choose like four more. 
call them your top five. Mm. There's a, a lot there to pick from. Not a Family Guy original, but it's uh, the first time I ever heard the song was watching an episode of Family Guy. Surfing Bird. Oh, yep, yep. Sur- Surfing Bird. Surfing Bird. I'd say is another one. Um, that counts. Let's see. My favorite part of that is when Peter's singing it in the kitchen and he starts having a spasm on the floor <laughs> during the during the the one blah, 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 blah part and the mm-hmm. <laughs> Bri- Brian's yes. like, "Oh my god, are you okay?" And then he's just <laughs> like right back to it. <laughs> Yeah, if you watch that spasm part in slow motion, the faces and contortions he makes are fucking hilarious. <laughs> I believe it. Oh uh, man! So what? What else? What else? Oh man! Um. <sighs> oh man! There's so many to choose from. <laughs> every Ava, every Ava monkey. <laughs> that one's pretty good, though. That's not really a not really a full song, but yeah. Yes. I mean, think of this. Um. Pretty much every Road to episode has a song in it, right? You've got yes. a Road to Road Road to Road Island. Mm-hmm. You've got You and I are so awfully different. Yeah, that mm-hmm. one. Um Also, fun fact, the one in um Road to Rupert that they do where it's just a few lyrics, but then the rest of the time Stewie's dancing with Richard Kelly in a live action scene. Mm-hmm. That is a direct parody of a Tom and Jerry special where Jerry was doing the exact same thing in place of Stewie. They took the footage from that exact thing and they just took Jerry out and replaced it with Stewie. In- for that. Interesting. <clears throat> yep. <clears throat> so that yeah, that was pretty cool. Um, I forgot to mention the song You've Got a Lot to See from uh, Brian Wallows and Peter's Swallows. Mm, um, okay. The episode is called Brian Wallows and Peter's Swallows because that's the episode where Peter grows a beard and a bird lives in it for a while. And he can't do anything about it because it's a rare white-breasted swallow. Yeah. Um, But that's the same episode where Brian is sentenced to community service taking care of an old lady who turns out to be famous uh, opera singer Pearl Burton. Mm -hmm. And... He tries to convince her to leave the house for the first time in years by singing a song to her about all the things that she's missed Mm -hmm. over time. And you know what's funny? That song is from, like, the early 2000s, like, late 90s, early 2000s, and it still holds up today. Like, everything he said. Like, especially the lyrics where he's like, um, the 50s brought the hippie breed, and decades (laughs) later things have changed indeed. We lost the values, but we kept the weed, (laughs) you know? And then the one where he's like, so let's go see the USA. They'll treat you right unless you're black or gay or Cherokee. <laughs> that's still true, too. <laughs> uh, so, like, that's that song is timeless. <laughs> yeah. You know, and he's like, he's like, the he's and he talks about how Ronald Reagan paved the way for movie stars to be in the White House. And he makes a joke about how we're not too far from voting for, um, uh, Feldman Kane talking about uh, Corey Feldman and um, I forget the other one, but oh no, Corey H- or Feldman Haim. So two Corys, Corey Feldman and Corey Haim. Uh, he was thinking, but it's half true because years later we got a freaking TV celebrity as a president. So yeah, <laughs> uh, we did. One of the most timeless Family Guy songs ever, if you ask me. Yeah. Uh, um. I also like Peter when he sings Rock Lobster, which is a real song. Rock Lobster. Uh, by the way. I think that's a real song by the B-52s, actually. Yes. Um, I could be wrong about who sang it, but I do know it's a real a real song. Um, and then there is the You Have AIDS song. <laughs> oh, yeah, the Barbershop, the Barbershop Quartet songs. They had a few of them. They had the AIDS one. They had the Vasectomy one. Yes. And then... It was a deleted scene on the band abortion episode, but they had a song explaining abortions, too. Okay. Uh, oh, that one is going to be in the third video. That's one of the season eight songs I forgot in the second video and p- plastered it in the third. Okay. In a random spot. So, 
Yeah, so that one, basically that same barbershop quartet that did the AIDS and vasectomy song, they come in and they explain abortion. Okay. Uh, in, in that deleted scene. So, another... Yeah, I think the third one's gonna have a lot of new songs for you. Yeah, a little bit. <laughs> you should you should be ex- you should be excited to hear all these new songs for the first time. Hell honestly. yeah! Especially especially uh, Candy Cohog Marshmallow, Tinder Makes You Gross, and Thank the Whites. Like those are all top tier songs okay. that you should be excited yes. for. Um, and especially because Family Guy doesn't really do sh- musical show tune numbers like that very often anymore. Right. Um, but when they do, like, there was an episode recently where Peter was singing with a f- uh, old famous singer about people's birthdays at work, and they were singing, you know, it's June, 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 something like that. And uh, at the end of the episode, Stewie actually breaks the fourth wall and explains to the audience where that song is from. And um, he said it was from an old um, Hammerstein musical called the carousel worker or something like that and explain what it was about but and then he's like to learn more ask your grandfather who was dragged to it on a first date and then had to get married to touch boob (laughs) (laughs) so but i'm like hey at least they took the time to explain what it is because they know that half their audience is 13 and doesn't know these old 1940 shows so god damn oh all right. Anyways, um, if we're yeah, on, on the topic of soundtracks, keeping it going. Um, oh, wait. Yeah, no, you didn't finish telling me your favorite songs real quick on Family Guy. Uh, y- y- you gave me uh, Surf and Bird and Bag of Weed. Give me three more. Evil Monkey? Nah, let's go with full songs. Full songs. Okay. Um... Road to the North Pole has two songs in them, two Christmas songs. All I really want for Christmas and Christmas time is killing us. And those are both. That second one was nominated for a, an Emmy. That song. Christmas time is Christmas. Christmas time is killing us was actually really good. Yes, it was. Um. I don't, okay, so that number three. <clears throat> um. And while you're thinking, another fun fact, some of the lyrics to the DVD versions of um, All I Really Want for Christmas from Road to the North Pole and Down Syndrome Girl from Extra Large Medium, the lyrics, Mm. some of the lyrics, not all, but some, like one or two verses in those songs, the lyrics are different on the DVD version than they are in the televised version. Okay. Yeah, like in the in the televised version of the Down Syndrome Girl song, Stewie si- sings a line about how her hugs are really tight, like a vice, and go on for an hour and squeezes the head off a teddy bear. But uh-huh. in the, in the DVD version, he makes a crack about how her eyes are so close together that they could kiss each other. Uh, so okay, and that's the that's the difference at the at the end before they do the tap dance solo. Um, okay. And, in the All I Really Want for Christmas song, um, when Brian's judging them for asking for so much things, in the televised version, the line is, don't you think this is too much stuff? And Peter says, poo on you, it's not enough. And Stewie's like, buddy boy, I got your Christmas right here, and grabs his crotch. Well, uh-huh. in the DVD version, it's similar. Brian says, don't you think this is too much stuff? And Peter says, suck my dick, it's not enough. <laughs> instead of poo, instead of poo on you, and Stewie says, "Why don't you go and chase cars, you queer?" And then Brian says, "Look who's talking." So there's the difference. God damn. Okay. The, t- the televised and DVD version of the songs. <laughs> yep. Jeez. Okay. Yep. <laughs> yeah. The DVDs are called uncensored for a reason. <laughs> I I'd say so. Yes. But we got three, two more songs out of you, and God, there's so many to pick from. I know there's a lot you haven't heard yet, but, you know, you've got the freaking FCC, Shapoopy, you've got a lot to see, oh, no, this the house freaking is freaking F- seat. The, the freaking FCC is up there for me. Yeah, I would say so. I would say and... so. Yeah, Shapoopy. You know what I noticed about Family Guy, by the way? What's that? Herbert... Herbert the Pervert has a surprising number of songs in it. That he does. 
Like I'm pr- like I think the second video in that setup I sent you probably has like four songs sung by him alone in them. Uh, mm-hmm. I know there's like, quite a few, but also one of them I thought you'd really appreciate because it's actually a direct, not even a parody, just word for word. I think it's the same. Well, I think it is a parody actually, but it is a direct parody to a song from Rocky Horror Picture Show, somewhere that's green. Um, it's the song where he's envisioning a future with him and Chris together and singing about what it would be like. Okay. Yeah. Um, where he's like, where Herbert's dressed up like, uh, like a woman and like, you know, he's got these like visions of them living in a house together and Chris is mowing the lawn and they have kids and they're Uh watching. He's like, and we sit down to watch Howdy Doody on a really big 12 inch screen (laughs) and Uh shit like that. Um, cause he's old. Uh, yeah. So that song I think is from Rocky Horror Picture Show. Okay. Or something. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah, and he's got a few of the episode. Oh, yeah, actually, one of the songs Herbert sings is another DVD exclusive. Uh, the episode where Peter and Lois, and I want to say Brian, go on vacation to Massachusetts, and that's where the spirit of Massachusetts is the spirit of America song comes in. Mm-hmm. Well, they hire Herbert to watch the kids. Huge mistake, obviously. Yes. Um, But in the DVD version, when... When he's going out, when he's going to their house the next morning to go watch them, he comes out in a suit and tie with an umbrella and a top hat, and he's like, uh, "I've got my best pressed vest, my suit and tie." He's like, "Now all I need is the boy." That's a DVD exclusive song too, and it's also another direct parody to a song from a musical. Okay, <laughs> I I think that's from Singing in the Rain. Uh, okay. that one. So, yeah. Uh. So, man, everybody in that show has got some fucking pipes, I tell you what. Except, fun fact, Mila Kunis can't sing. And so, whenever Meg sings in an, uh, in something in the show, it's either Tara Strong or Seth MacFarlane's sister, Rachel MacFarlane, who plays Haley on American Dad. Okay. And has also done other voices. She plays Alana, the girl I was telling you about, that comes in and tries to take over the family after Lois hires her to help with housework okay. in a recent episode. She plays her in that one, so, um, so yeah, uh, nice. so yeah, you had uh, you had bag of weed and uh, freaking FCC, um, and Shapoopy, and Shapoopy, yeah, and the other ones. Okay, um, so if we're talking about soundtracks on movies, I. I have to mention um, Hello Zep from the Saw movies because it's the it's the stinger at the end of every Saw movie that plays during the plot twist, Mm -hmm. Um, you know, and it always has that real that build up. It's, you know, it's a small build up first and it's kind of like twangy and you the little chimes and like ding, 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 ding. And uh but eventually it builds up into this huge swell where things start to really resonate with the audience, like the twist mm-hmm. is revealed. And it's like, bum, 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 ba da 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 ba da na da na na da na da na na da na na And it just keeps building up like that until you get the twist and it's then it just, like, empties out, like, ba na And then it, like, you know, fades out as, like, the horrible fate befalls the survivors mm-hmm. and shit. It's amazing like they do a good job with it every time and each and every saw movie has a slightly different rendition of it with the most famous rendition being the one from the original movie yes the whole reason the whole reason that track is called hello zep is because it plays when you find when you get that plot twist in the first movie that zep was just another player in the game and that the real killer had been laying in the bathroom with them the whole time Mm -hmm. so fucking smart like to this day I still think they have yet to outdo themselves as far as the plot twist at the end of the first movie goes yes uh so and the Saw movies have a lot of music but when you think of that though that's the only one that people remember is that track and I know you know the music I'm talking about you can hear it in your head yes it it 
it plays at the end of every Saw movie. I'm going to rapid um, fire some uh, Disney soundtracks. Yes. Tarzan. Oh, the yeah. A lot of um, a lot of Phil Collins original songs in Tarzan. Yes. Not really not really show tunes in the movie itself, but more of a overarching soundtrack with original songs written for it. Uh, the Lion King. Yup. Uh, let's see. Lilo and Stitch. Only, really, the only songs that were, like, originally made for Lilo and Stitch were Hawaiian Roller Coaster Ride and I fucking forget the name of the other one. Uh, yeah, I don't know either, but I thought that movie was mostly just Elvis songs. <laughs> yeah, that's, yeah, there was just a couple songs. But there's also, um, uh, the Goofy movie with the, the songs by the, the in-universe original artist, um, uh, Powerline. Yep. Yep. Uh, My favorite see, song from else? that movie, though, is actually the the song that they're singing while they're uh, while they're driving on the road, and like everybody in all the other cars gets involved in the song too. It's like a big mm -hmm. like a big chorus thing. I can't remember. I think it's like "Open Road" or "On the Road Again" or something. Um, Out on the open road, yeah, open road. Yeah, I like that one. Um, Randy Newman's soundtrack for the Toy Story. Yes. Daft Punk doing the entire soundtrack for Tron Legacy. Yep. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that was Let's dope. See. That was dope as hell. Hell yeah. Uh, Kyle Massey did uh the did a song for the Underdog movie. Mm, Okay. Yeah. Yeah, let me throw my hat in the ring for Encanto having an amazing soundtrack and you want to talk about cartoons that I yes. have I have songs on my playlist of. Um we don't talk about Bruno and uh Surface Pressure are both like on my playlist. Okay. Yeah, Surface Pressure being my favorite song from the movie. That's the one the strong girl sings about feeling overwhelmed with all the responsibilities given to her um, yeah that one i a lot of people a lot of like older siblings found that one very relatable mm -hmm. i thought it was well done yes um not just rapid firing movies but i'll just rapid fire some of my favorite overall disney songs in general we've got yeah. everybody wants to be a cat I knew that was coming. The cat's the only cat who knows where it's at. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. We have be our guest. Be our guest. Put our service to the test. Tie a napkin around your neck, Shattery, and we'll provide the rest. Yep. See, now, one of my favorite songs from Tarzan, more specifically the, the Tarzan soundtrack was... The version of Trash in the Camp that oh, Phil okay. Collins did with In Sync. Okay, I see. Yeah, I was. Actually, I like that version. <laughs> I was actually. I was gonna say "You'll Be in My Heart" um, as the song, but that nope, was yeah, trash that's in, good. Trash in the Camp by Phil Collins featuring In Sync was very well done. <laughs> All That's, done aca it was all done a cappella. Having famous pop artists and rock artists do covers of songs from Disney movies seems to be a popular thing. Um, yeah. It's happened quite a bit. In fact, there is an entire uh remade like the entire um Nightmare Before Christmas soundtrack done by popular rock artists like Marilyn Manson and yes. um yeah, and a bunch of others. Um, in fact, I can't They're... remember who all is on it, but I remember that they Marilyn Manson did a version of This is Halloween for that one. 
Yes. There's also... Um... The Disney Mania albums where you got covers of different yep. Disney songs like Raven Simone did a cover of Under the Sea from The Little Mermaid. Yep. Jump 5 did Hawaiian Roller Coaster Ride. Um, uh, Allie and AJ did Zippity Doo Yep, I remember. Oh, wow, that's an old one from a movie that you definitely can't find anywhere anymore because of how racist it was. <laughs> but, no, yeah, no. Uh, uh, Christy Carlson Romano did Colors of the Wind. But I've never seen... Um, what the hell is the movie? A Song of the South. That's what Zippity Doodah is from. Song of the South. It was one of Disney's live action cartoon mixes, like yes. Mary Poppins. And mm -hmm. the only reason I know that song is because they used to have on VHS when I was a kid these Disney sing along videos that were. I remember those. I had a lot of the, those. They were hosted by Jiminy Cricket. He would come in yep. and he'd be like, oh, hey. And he's like, here's a song from this movie. And then like it would play and it would have the lyrics on screen for you to sing along to, like karaoke. Um, mm -hmm. But it would play the song. And that was one of them. It was, uh, you know, zippity-doo-dah, zippity-a, my, oh, my, what a wonderful day. Yeah. That was one of them. Yeah, they've done so many covers. Uh, yes. Like you said. Oh, I got another one. You got, um, look for the bare necessities. necessities. The simple, <laughs> the bare, simple necessities. bare necessities. Forget about your worries and your strife. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I remember those. Uh, Be a Man from Mulan. Real good yes. one. Two. Um... Aladdin has two phenomenal songs in my opinion. Well, all a lot of them are phenomenal, but top three definitely are um, the the opening song when he's running from the guards and he's like a one jump ahead of the bread line. Dun, 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 dun. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I like that. Um, Friend like me, obviously the genie song. Yes. Uh, probably the best song in the whole movie. And then, of course, the Prince Ali song that he's singing during the parade. You know, the Prince Ali, Ali is he, Ali Ababwa. Uh, I quite love that one. And I absolutely loved the Will Smith renditions of both those songs as well. Yes. Uh, from the live action one, too. <clears throat> That's one thing that they always get right in the live action movies, at least, is the songs. Uh mm -hmm. Uh, Melissa McCarthy absolutely killed it singing Poor Unfortunate Souls. Yes, she did. In the li live action Mermaid. Yes. Yeah. She did uh, so good. She Probably the, the best part of that whole movie. <laughs> scuttlebutt? Yeah, that was an original for the live action version. Yeah. <laughs> they do throw in some extra ones here and yes. there. Um, you know what, though? You know a lot, how a lot of those Disney movies had like straight to DVD or or video like sequels that didn't end up in theaters like the originals. Mm -hmm. um, you know, Aladdin had two of those, and yes. I distinctly remember Return of Jafar being just okay. But I remember everyone, myself included, really loving the third one, Aladdin and the King of Thieves. Um, and I remember that one having a really memorable song in the beginning when Aladdin and Jasmine are going to get married and mm. Genie's singing a song about it. He's like, they're, they're going to have a party and it's going to be the wedding of the century. Like, mm -hmm. I remember that. That's one of my favorites, too. That was like one of the few times where one of their straight-to-video sequels was actually almost as good as the original. Yes. <laughs> but, uh, but, yeah... Um, so, yeah, yes, uh, overall, though, yeah, music can be quite impactful in how it makes the audience feel. I remember the opening of Mass Effect 3 when the Reapers are invading Earth mm -hmm. and you fly away, you, es you, you escape, but as you escape, you see the Reapers destroying everything, and the music that plays is a mixture of, like, soft, sad piano music and then, like, heavy boom to really send home like what's going on mm -hmm. it's like you're flying you're flying away you're watching earth being destroyed and it's really sad it's like bum 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 
then one of the giant aliens will attack with a laser beam or something, and the music will go... You know, just to really push it home. And it gave me Hans Zimmer vibes. Hans Zimmer being, like, a very famous composer who does a lot of music for movies. Mm -hmm. And um, it sounded similar to that. I think he did the music for Inception, for example. So... You know, similar, like, dark vibes, I think. You know, he, I think he does a lot of, like, Christopher Nolan music. Uh, so. Okay. But. But, um. So. For the sake of time <laughs> and all that, I think we'll go ahead and wrap this one up here. But there's so much that we can talk about yes. when it comes to video game. So or to soundtracks from yes. things. That. Just like the voice actors episode I did, that I we did, we're, we're I think come we back will to put this a, one. Yeah, we're going to put a pin in it, and we're going to come back to it another yes. time. And, and you know, talk, because there's a lot there to talk about. Like, we barely scratched the surface of some of the most amazing soundtracks mm -hmm. out there. Um, so... We'll, we'll come back to this one, maybe not anytime soon, just like the other one, you know, a few more ideas here and there first, but we will come back to it. So this will be a part one with a part two coming sometime in the future. Just yes. don't know when. Might even be, might even be next season. We might even wait till next season to retackle both of these topics. Yeah. We'll see. So, um, you know, <laughs> more variety that way. <coughs> but I will tell you now, I think our next episode, we're going to talk about tropes. Uh, tropes and cliches. Um, and we will we will get into a deep dive yes. about those in the next episode. It'll be fun. I'm gonna have the TV tropes website pulled up, and we're gonna talk about some very specific, some of my favorite tropes and things. Okay. So this ought to be th that's gonna be fun. It's gonna be real fun. Um, but all right, that's it for this episode. Let us know about some of your favorite uh, soundtracks from games, movies, some of your favorite songs from things that were part of them. Uh, you know, write to us either in the comments down below if you're watching on YouTube, or you can email me at uh, over uh, podcastoversoul at gmail.com, mm -hmm. or you can find me on the website formerly known as Twitter uh, at oversoul53. You can find me over on uh, Twitter at the Vaping Fiend, and you can find me over on TikTok at the Vaping Fiend. Alrighty, and of course, if you are on YouTube, remember to smash that like button and a special shout out and thank you to our host providers, Podserve.fm, for nineteen dollars a month. You can host your podcast on every platform, including Spotify and Apple Podcasts. So, yeah, um, and. You just upload it and put in the information, and they take care of the rest. So, uh, until next time, we'll catch you in the next episode. Have a good couple of weeks, everybody. Bye for now. Bye.